601, I will call the Board of Selectmen February 27th, 2023 meeting to order. The uh, first item that I'm going to address on our agenda this evening, we're going to go out of, um, out of order a little bit. We're going to address the fence at 162 Canomo Point Road, which is the toddler fence from leasehold there, McKenzie. We do have somebody in the room with us this evening, I believe representing Harlan Wendell, who is also on the line with us. If you'd like to state your name, where you're from, and just why you're here this evening before we talk about this. Of course, thank you folks. Um, my name, for the record, Connor Walsh, uh, offices at 8 Washington Street in Beverly. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Harlan Wendell and Carol Wendell, um, who are the immediate abutters to uh, 162 Canoma Point Road. Um, not here expecting to really have much um, have much to say outside of just confirming that the revised plans that were submitted uh, by Thayer McKenzie, uh, who is the, the leaseholder at uh, 162 Canoma Point Road, is in fact the, the ultimate plan that is, is reviewed by the board tonight. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Connor. And the revised plan that we're discussing is going to be the, um, the final set that says at the top, McKenzie Fence Plan Revised 2-22-23. That's what I have as well. So, Perfect. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay. So I had an opportunity. We actually, uh, this has been tabled from our last meeting, and I, we tabled it because I wanted an opportunity to do a site visit, walk the property, and see where the original plan was laid out. Um, it is, as you can see from the plans, it does about, directly about a fire lane, and I wanted to make sure that there was no um, issues with the fire department being able to get from property to property from Middle Road to Canoma Point Road. Uh, while I was out there, I had an opportunity to call Ms. Um, McKenzie on the phone and we had a conversation. She's actually um, worked with us to move the fence in closer, so she's gonna jog the fence from the corner of the house around a tree and then back in toward the property and then straight up to um, Middle Road so that it doesn't encroach on the fire lane as it did kind of in the beginning. So I... What happens with the bike rack? Wasn't there a bike rack in the original one? I don't and why yeah, was there was it's on the plan was, I don't know why a bike racks on the plan I mean what she puts on the property inside her fence shouldn't be an issue uh, I didn't know whether it was a public bike rack or something I don't think so. I don't it's think so the, there's no bike rack down hole. there <clears throat> yeah yeah that was in so she's cutting in and going up yeah that was in plan here's, here's revision number two plan. yeah that was the second one yeah yeah the I'm not first really one sure didn't why. have a bike rack in it right but that, you know, that would be somebody choosing to put a bike rack on their leasehold. Right. right. Nothing to do with public domain. Okay, and, and so it was just immaterial. I think so. I mean, if it ends up outside the fence right. in the fire lane, we have a different problem. But for right now, it being within inside the perimeter of the fence, I have no issue with that. So does, any, does the board have any questions for either the attorney or discussion? No. No. I just want to add that we got an email from Harlan Wendell today indicating that this latest version of the plan was fully acceptable to him. Yes. I and do. I think that should be put on the record. Okay, perfect. Mr. Wendell, you are on the line with us. Did you have anything to add before we take a motion on this fence request? Uh, I am on the line and I don't. Thank you so much. So I will entertain a motion to accept, oh, hang on, this is a lease. Um, I will entertain a motion to move that the Board of Selectmen in its capacity as Canoma Point Commissioners approve Thayer McKenzie's request to erect a three and a half foot high wooden fence and a small portion of five foot high wooden fence at 162 Canoma Point Road, map 108, lots 44 A and B, in accordance with the plans and specifications submitted by Ms. McKenzie on February 22nd, 2023 via electronic mail subject to all terms and conditions of the land lease said for premises, including but not limited to Article 5 and 9. I just have a question before the board votes. That, that motion may have been put together for the original plan where there were two types of fencing involved. On this final plan, and, and maybe council can tell us, isn't it just one type of fencing? That's my understanding. My, my client may be able to confirm um, whether that is inconsistent, but that, that's my understanding as well. I have the, 
So we would the the motion could be revised to, to just talk five, about the three and a half foot. Well, this this new version doesn't seem to indicate which height of fence is chosen, and it doesn't show two different line colors like the original plan did. In, in the email, it doesn't specify as well. Okay. So before anybody seconds that motion, we're going to, do you think I should just take it out, the three and a half and the five, and not have a height? Well, do you have a height that you would accept as a maximum? I think that the three and a half, this was supposed to be a dog fence. You could just say up to five feet high and put a limitation on it. Does anybody have any limits to the, side, the height of the fence? Did Mr. Harlan have any concerns, or was there what was their conversation? My conversation has been that it was, you know, a, a toddler fence. So I would assume that the three and a half foot was the the expectation um, between the parties. Harlan, I'm not sure whether you um, whether you have anything to add there. I, I was expecting three and a half feet. I didn't know there was anything about five feet on. Yeah. yeah, the original plan had two types of fence proposed. Does the revised plan have two types of plan? No. The revised plan does not. Well, I mean, for my preference would be three and a half feet. There aren't very many fences at Canoma Point to begin with. So the original proposal said the fence marked in red is proposed at three and a half feet in height and a wooden open colonial style to match the historic carriage house sited on the property. There's a small section of five foot fence marked in green proposed to which is a buffer to the boathouse traffic and seasonal porta potty. Yeah, it would seem to me that the three and a half is what's remaining. And it looks like that that five foot piece, which was just a small piece dropped out dropped out. Okay. So I would read the thing at three and a half at unless and the half. board has other ideas. Does that, no. no, we're fine with that. Okay. So I will entertain a motion that the Board of Selectmen in its capacity as the Kenoma Point Commissioners approve Thayer McKenzie's request to erect a three and a half foot high wooden fence at 162 Kenoma Point Road, map 108, lots 44 A and B in accordance with the plans and specifications submitted by Ms. McKenzie on February 22nd, 2023 via electronic mail, subject to all terms and conditions of the land lease for said premises, including but not limited to articles five and nine so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, folks. And I, I appreciate you um, going out of order. Um, this evening, so. No worries. Have a nice night. Where is it on the agenda? So we check it off. One point commissioners. This is Robbins Island Road. Oh, no, where is it then? Right here. Oh, got it. Brendan, if you want to start, um, we could probably get through one or two of your items before we head into an executive session. Sure. So the first item I have is an update on two projects that went to the Conservation Commission on February 21st. Now, the board, two of the board members were present for that, for those hearings. The first project had to do with the stone pier renovation out at Kenomo Point, and the um, Conservation Commission voted to approve that with minimal conditions. That was mine. What happened to the uh, third, third one, the uh, um, public water supply well? That went right through. Okay, again so that with was on there. That was that the the en right. The engineer um, has owes them some information because there wasn't quite enough information about erosion controls and such on the plan. Yep. But rather than having them come all the way back in for something that's obviously needed, they said, "If you give us a revision, we'll approve it with that on it." Okay. So then we um, move to the Apple Street project. And with respect to that project, the commission continued the hearing. Um, it's a much more complicated project. They, of course, did not have comments back from the Department of Environmental Protection yet. And it makes sense, everyone agreed that it makes sense that they get those, um, those comments back. They also asked our engineering consultants for more information which will be provided in between meetings or at the next meeting. In the continued hearing, 
is actually going to be on uh, March 14th at 7.15 p.m. And in fact, that's listed on your reminders. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll go back again and we'll see where that goes. Um, let's see. While I'm on that topic, I think it's important to note that we did get a revised uh, engineering cost analysis and the project is still on track at 4.5 million. That's escalated into two fiscal years from now and that includes contingency. Uh, you have a copy of that for your, for your review. The uh, next item has to do with the Economic Development Committee. The committee held uh, a meeting recently and one of the key considerations is getting to what the final light fixture should be for the downtown lighting project. And in your packages, you have a copy of something that's getting us a lot closer. Looks like this. So yeah, so that was not approved um, because it's an open light. So We're looking for more. So uh, at the end, uh, well, by the end of the Economic Development Committee meeting, everyone said we were looking around because really none of the three that you looked at before were really anyone's favorite. We saw this one and it happened to also be dark sky compliant, which people have commented could be an important consideration. The issue with that though is any dark sky compliant fixture is going to not have glass where you expect glass. And dirt and salt spray go, get up in there on the actual um, luminary. That becomes a problem because frequently you'll have to go out and clean these. And we really don't have, we're not equipped for that. Whereas if you choose a, a fixture that has glass panels in it, our engineer says that when it rains and there's a wind driven rain, it's very effective on cleaning the glass panels. And so they're almost self cleaning that way. So the first thought we need to discuss is whether or not the board is absolutely requiring dark sky compliance. My understanding is that um, the glass in a non-compliant fixture refracts light uh, about 1% more than if you had nothing there. So it's, it's minimal. Uh, I'm just concerned about, about future maintenance and making sure that we have a way to keep these lights bright and, and in looking, looking good through through time. So the same mechanism that cleans the glass on the non-dark sky doesn't clean the. Mold. It doesn't because it's kind of sheltered. Stuck and this engineer said, particularly in the winter when you really want to see these things, salt and spray is going up there. And it, you've had salt spray on your headlights on your sure, car. Sure, sure, yeah. It's the same thing, <clears throat> and we just don't have. We're not equipped to deal with that. And I can tell you that. Dark sky compliance within the next few months might become a requirement for any new installations. Not, not that if we put it in now, we'll be forced to change, but this might be your only opportunity to move ahead with this, as opposed to, if you're inclined to, as opposed to a um, dark sky compliant. I also know that the EDC chairman is on the line with us this evening if you wanna talk with her. So how much would a, just a guess at how much this dark sky compliant light would impact dark sky because of all the other I illumination think so. around? No, but all the other light around. Right, 1% in a perfect world. But what Peter's saying is it's, it's definitely a function of where you locate this light. If we're out on, you know, the backside of Choate Street or something and there are no street lights or whatever, and you, and you put one of these up, you probably would diminish the view of, of the stars and the sky. But where it is now is already flooded with sodium lights and, yep. and um, uh, spotlights that are actually not town lights. They're lights that are part of Buildings the businesses. I'm wondering if so I'm not matter. sure that it does matter in this case. And 
given the maintenance, I, I would still side with not going with it. Now, with respect to the final design, if we can get dark sky, non-dark sky out of the way, I'm confident that the EDC can look at some other non, if it's non-dark sky, um, non-dark sky um, designs and arrive at something. They, they, they want it to be just a little bit more historic than this. But this got them much closer than even the other things. So this is not at. what they want? They, they want to tweak it to be even more historic. They liked the look of this fixture. Yeah. And if they could find this fixture in a non-dark sky, meaning it has glass panels, if, if, if they could find that and it, they tweak it just a little bit, that's really what they're looking for. And I was on the EDC call, and again, Jody could speak to this, but I would say that the majority of the EDC members did not prefer the dark sky. Did not what? Did not prefer the dark sky. I think they want to go with the, with the glass, clear, non-dark sky. Because of the self-cleaning component? I think that's one factor. Yeah. Jody, do you want to unmute and speak to this? Sure. Thank you. I think um, the original light fixture that we all uh, liked the best was uh, the full glass panels. They're the most historic. Um, this this fixture um, just really doesn't doesn't speak to us as a historic piece. And in addition, on the dark sky light, the light comes from the top of the fixture shining down. So it looks even less historic and it will, you know, get filthy, will have maintenance issues. So um, I, I'm not in favor of the, that dark sky choice. And we discussed it as a board. We, we picked out the one we liked and then uh, looked around at what was available for dark sky and wasn't, didn't quite meet our, our, uh, what we had in mind, I guess, for historic. And the fact that it's not going to really have a dark sky effect where these lights are going to be um, probably speaks to the fact that we shouldn't really go that route because it's going to be more cost effective. Are they more expensive to purchase dark sky? or? I don't, I don't think there's an appreciable difference, no. It depends on the manufacturer and the style that you right. choose. Yep. Any other questions? In fact, I'll, I'll just mention one more thing. We're going with stainless steel poles. That's the most important thing because of where these are, and they should last right. a lot longer than if we went with a common steel pole. Yeah, I get. Sure. I mean, the fact of the matter is, this is downtown. I mean, the expectation of dark sky. I, you know, I, I don't know how strong that is. So I, I totally agree with it. You're fine with that. So does the board want to? So I will entertain a motion to go with non dark sky light fixture for the causeway lighting. And do you have a preference as to whether this board chooses the final one or will, will you? I prefer that the uh, Economic Development yeah. Committee choose. I mean, that's, that's yes. So I, I'll further the motion to say in the Board of Selectmen prefers that the Economic Development Committee choose the final light design. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, at this time, I recommend that the board move into executive session uh, to discuss employment contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Um, I recommend uh, that the chairman declare that the board will be returning to regular session to continue with board business. All those in favor by roll call vote, please. Peter Fippen, aye. Guy Bradford, aye. Ruth Perrine, aye. Aye. Chief will come get you shortly. Thank you for patiently waiting for us to return from executive session. We are at 729 and we're gonna continue with the town administrator's report. And you're probably tabling the 625 item on yes, the agenda. Please. My next, um, uh, let's see, I have several items that I wanna cover when the finance committee is here. Wage and salary scale would be one of them. So I'll move on to um, possible revision of rules and regulations regarding working from home. When our rules and regulations were first um, created in 2001, working from home was not a thing. The technology was not really even there for it. Obviously through COVID it came up leaps and bounds. Um, and given the fact that it is now a um, real thing, it might be uh, 
beneficial for the board in its capacity as personnel board to put some things around it, put some guidelines around it, and enter those into the personnel rules and regulations. Um, for instance, we have part-time employees that sometimes work from home when that may or may not be the best policy. Um, obviously, working from home has its merit and its advantages during certain situations. Uh, and, and not here to flesh out the whole thing tonight. My question is, does the board want me to put together a framework and a recommendation for you to consider at a future meeting? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure other communities have done that already, that you have yes. guidelines to follow. Yes. Yeah. I also agree. I, my other comment on this, when I was reading the possible revision of personal rules and regulation, I know this was regarding um, working from home, but can we also visit um, comp time versus regular time? So our part-timers can work up to 19 hours a week. Correct. Sometimes they go over, and I think that at times they're they're holding over time and using it at different times, yeah, and but I that's think, not intended. I think we've already addressed that. I think that the town account is making sure that if someone has to temporarily go over the 19 hours, which is permissible without triggering benefits, they're paid for every one of those hours, and then the time that they would have been a slower time, they just don't get paid. And it's taken care of that way. I think we've already addressed it. So it, it's not defined in rules and regs? We don't no, need to? I okay. don't think we do. Okay. So I'll, I'll put something together with respect to working from home, bring it back to the board. The Gregory Island lot sale process update we are still waiting for the assessors to complete their analysis and until you have uh, their word on on the assessed values and they're also working with the building inspector to determine whether it would be plausible for any of the um, adjacent parcels to be purchased and turned into a larger parcel that perhaps could be a buildable lot so until again that's where it stands i don't have anything else to report there uh, then we have contracts for solid waste management, hauling, and then for disposal, and then for the provision of pay-as-you-throw bags. We have worked out terms with the management and hauling vendor, which would be Commonwealth. We've worked out terms with the pay-as-you-throw bag vendor, that would be waste zero. And we are waiting on disposal. Um, that would be Covanta. But they gave me a copy of their standard contract, which has some things in it that need to change. And their attorney was away last week, and they, don't, they did not have a chance to get it done for tonight. So you could either sign the two now and sign Covanta um, later or just sign all three later is there any, there's no threat that covanta isn't going to come up with no something. they already gave us no there's no threat and really when it comes to disposal they're, they're really the only game in town right. so yeah. i don't have a concern about signing two now and another one later sure um what the board should do regardless of what it signs tonight we do need to for budget purposes and it's something we can talk about with the Board of Public Works, it's not really the finance. The finance committee only cares that you collect enough money in stickers plus bags to meet the budget. It's a question of where you're gonna set the bag fee versus where you're gonna, how much you're gonna set the sticker fee at. The logic is that if perhaps you are someone that's single or maybe you're someone that's elderly and you don't generate a lot of trash, you're, you're gonna want to buy that sticker at a reasonable price, and then you save because you're not putting out a bag maybe even every week. Um, if you do it based all on bags, then you get almost no revenue from that person. If you do it based all on stickers, the sticker price might be too high for somebody in that situation. So there's a balance point between <laughs> the sticker price and the per bag price. I don't have anything 
yet on that, and I think really the Board of Public Works should come back in and talk to you so that you can nail that down. Yeah. But it won't have an effect on these two contracts because we're paying the max amount of money. It's up to us to figure out how to get the money. And we'd want to we'd want to set these when we come to our first de decision on these two. We'd want to set it for as short a period of time as possible so that if, if we got it wrong, we can correct it. Well, right now, the hauler is proposing a five-year contract, mm. um, which needs a town meeting vote. That's actually one of the draft town meeting articles. No, no, no. I'm no, sorry. I meant about the sticker rate, which we oh, just bring back to town rate. meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bag rate and the, and the sticker rate. So what you would do there, since we no longer have to set solid waste handling fees at an annual town meeting, you would have, you would have a chance to amend it in November. Okay. So okay. you would have that yeah. opportunity. Well, yeah. And the other thing I'm talking with Covanter about is whether they will match the five-year, because then you'd have your management and hauling in sync. with a match to Covanta's disposal, um, where Waste Zero is on the state contract, and you can renew them anyway. So on that, Brendan, is there any um, possibility that we lose um, negotiation power if we sign the other two contracts, knowing that we're... They're apples and oranges. Up? Yeah, but they're the ones who take the waste, and there's nobody. They've already given us it. the price. You already have the okay. price. So right. it comes down to certain things that they wanted in the back end of the contract yeah, yeah. that have nothing okay. to do with the other vendors or the price. Okay. So I'm not worried about that. All right. So I would recommend that we get the Board of Public Works in here for your next meeting and that you sign the two contracts tonight. Okay. So I will entertain a motion to have the um, Board of Selectmen vote to sign the contracts with Commonwealth Waste Transportation LLC for the transfer station management and solid waste hauling and Waste Zero Inc. provision of pay as you throw bags and stickers, all subject to appropriation and contract length approval by town meeting for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 These are from And all three of these, by the way, are going to be subject to appropriation and duration by town meeting. And yep. the vendors know that. Sorry. That's the only one? One signature? Uh, the other one was only for the chair, the way they oh, set okay. up the contract. All right. The next item is the fact that our zoning review project is going along well. Um, there was a planning meeting recently, and out of that came what you have in your packages. Um, really not a lot of need for discussion unless you had uh, specific points you wanted to cover, but it looks like we have a fairly good plan in the works. Uh, there will be a joint meeting of the selectmen and the planning board for a kind of working session Oops, on March 13th. And then there will be the next, actually March 22nd, I'm sorry, possibility of somebody from the selectmen going on March 13th, definite joint meeting on March 22nd. And then the next community forum that's solely for the zoning uh, review is April 12th. So is there any other comment on that right now? Nope. No. Did you skip over the turf? Yes, because I want to talk about some I items when the finance committee's with you. Okay. The same would apply for the draft annual town meeting warrant. I'll skip over that. Uh, Apple Street project federal funding update. So as you know, we're on a waiting list for potential 90% funding that would come through the COVID disaster. <clears throat> I've been told by the people 
at MEMA that we could also get on, well, it's one or the other, we could get on a, um, another disaster number for 75% federal funding, but a much better shot at getting our projects, a project submitted to FEMA by MEMA earlier to, to move the thing along. What, is, what does disaster number mean? means whenever they have a particular um, event, and COVID was considered a long event, they assign it its own code. And so the COVID disaster has a certain number within uh, MEMA, FEMA. And that came with special permission for the federal funding, anything that gets funded under that disaster, Got to it. be the 90%. Got it. Okay. So you would say, well, why would we ever move to 75% if we're at least potentially going to get 90? Well, there's no guarantee that we'll ever get to the 90 if we don't get off the waiting list. And secondly, getting our project engaged with a different disaster number at 75% keeps it moving instead of waiting till perhaps July to find out about the 90% and then having to go into the standard 75% program anyway. anyway some other time. And third, I spoke with the people from the MVP program, Mass, uh, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. That would be the non-federal grant. It would be a state grant, either 90-10 or 75-25 from MVP. We've been encouraged not to apply for MVP funding this spring because we will not have our federal funding, no matter which way we go with federal funding, we will not have it ready to go, and we will not have all permits in hand by design. So they're saying, come back to us next spring after you've dealt with your federal funding, and to them, funding 10% of a project or funding 25% of the project are both great for them, because most people come to them looking for 75% of the project. So. To me, it would seem like if, if, I, if I talk again to the people at MEMA and they say, yeah, it's better to just keep going right along with, with the other disaster, forget about the 90%, we'll get you locked in, we'll get you reviewed by uh, FEMA, then we could actually accomplish having something ready to go that, so that next spring we simply go for our MVP funding. We have a very good chance, I'm told from the conference I had, of getting it and then you're ready to actually start so, at 100% funding, non-town funding. So the 90% we'll know in July, but that's just letting FEMA know, then FEMA has to go through their evaluation, which might take... Whereas I'm told that if we just want to say, forget about that waiting list, go into yeah. this other one at 75, she thinks that it will actually advance more quickly. We can get to the business of going through the entire FEMA process, which is not fast, and it, it seems better to me because MVP is not shy about 25%. That's nothing to them. That's what she told me. That'd be like 1.2 million. And she says, fine, we'll find up to $3 million per community. I said, is it independent of the size of the community? And she said, yeah, we don't look at it that way. Will it still be nothing to them a year from now? We're not going to make MVP this year anyway because we will not have the permits done. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, right. And do we know, do, do we have lined up the next federal disaster number that we're going to go yes. for? Yes, yes. That she told, I don't have it right on right, right, top right. of it, but yes. And there's, and we're no waiting list on that. Correct. One. That's why she's saying, so if you don't care about the 10 versus the 25, you know, she said, talk to me, uh, to MVP about that, which I did. It doesn't sound like they care too much. Then she said, you're probably better off just getting started. Okay, that's going to be more effective and efficient that's, for us. And I'll talk to her again in case anything has changed, but I wanted to, it's kind of complicated, and I wanted to sure. give you that. I get it. Yeah. Okay. So I will, I will get more information and, and proceed accordingly. Then we had a um, notice of a new grant, Planning for Housing Production, and it's a way to... Um, assist a town, you know, now that we have an affordable housing trust, uh, working toward making the environment as optimal as possible. 
The issue, though, is we think we're limited in bandwidth here. Our town planner is only on for 19 hours a week. And right now, she's got to finish up several grants that she's working on, including managing the Green Communities Program. And she's going to become more and more important with respect to the zoning effort. And so while I think this will come into play, I think it would be better if we have her look at this next year. Are we eligible? Did we go through the elig eligibility? We would be eligible. We yes. are. We meet their criteria. We don't think we have the bandwidth, though. Yeah. However, I do think that the Affordable Housing Trust members are still working toward a comprehensive master plan on their own in looking at um, a production plan. I think that we're going to start doing that as a group. With, I mean, she's support staff anyway. I don't think we should necessarily look at the program, but we will probably be prepared. And then if you, right, because now in the next year, if you really flesh out what it is you want, then you could go into a program like this and really make it fly. So, so we have a DHCD approved housing production plan in place now? No, we don't. We don't. don't. Okay, so we're not really eligible. No. Right now. But members of the Affordable Housing Trust have been talking about this. Yeah. So that yeah, will yeah. be part of what we're working on. Yep. Oh, I see what you're saying, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. That so, aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we will next year. Be yeah. Eligible. So it's just something I wanted, you know, now that we have this resource, the Affordable Housing Trust, we're going to need to plug into these things as they come up. But we'll look at that next spring. And those are all the things in my report that I wanted to cover outside of the Finance Committee. We have 13 minutes before Finance Committee joins us, so we'll go through some of the regular agenda items. I will entertain a motion to approve the weekly warrant in the amount of $94,561.43. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to exempt from Section 20 of Chapter 268A of the General Laws the contracts and amounts for the individual listed below contained within the 2923 warrant pursuant to subsection D of said section. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to exempt from Section 20 of Chapter 268A of the General Laws the contracts and amounts for individual listed below contained within the warrant pursuant to subsection D of said section. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the Selectmen's February 6, 2023 open meeting and executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the approval and signature of a renewal rollover for the Council on Aging Council on Aging's Title 3B grant through senior care in the amount of $1,500. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the chairman's signature of the authority to file a resolution with respect to the town's authorized borrowing of $2.6 million from the state revolving loan fund. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are going to table merit pay. Well, for, do you want me to do yours now? Yeah, because I think you're, I think you're ready for that. If, okay, so I'm going to take part of this agenda item. I will entertain a motion to grant 3% merit pay to Town Administrator Brendan Zubricki. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, we were all provided a revision to the employment contract for Treasurer Collector Br Brooke Friedrich, and I will entertain a motion to approve the contract for Brooke. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to accept the resignation for Lorene, from Lorene Sanderson as a conservation commission. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So I will entertain a motion to consider a request to appoint Joshua Sippel to the position of probationary firefighter on the Essex Fire Department. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I will abstain from that vote. I will. Uh, the next one I think table. also needs to happen with the Finance Committee here. I will. Da, da, da. Next is a review of a few questions from two people interested in renting Centennial Grove for a private event. So we have. 
two recommend or two requests before us. The biggest question here is, we don't really know what's going to be happening with the pavilion construction. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it's it's in recent years, Pam. How many Grove rentals do we get in a summer? Maybe one, maybe two. Yeah. So if you just said to people this year, we're not, we're not renting the Grove this year, you'd probably be better off, and it's not at the risk of a lot of revenue loss. Then if we get our grant and we turn the Grove around, then you pick that up on the back end. Yeah. I was, I was not inclined to entertain these. I was just going to discuss what the questions yeah. were, but it makes more sense, honestly. With potential construction and the unknowns, it doesn't, from maybe even a liability standpoint, it doesn't make sense to have events there this, this year. Not for a few hundred bucks. No. Yeah, this see this this season. So 2023. I guess we could revisit it in 2024. So do we need to at some point in the next period of time um, put together guidelines for that? For what? I think after the construction phase is done, we'll want to visit. Yeah. What so is the right fee, now, what is? But that's economic development committee is really working on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right now, you could vote to simply say for the upcoming 2023 season because it really is all within 2023 you will not be extending rentals of either the cottage or the picnic grove to any to any party i don't want to exclude any programs by camp dory that won't right. exclude because we're talking it's not about rentals. rental okay right. so i'll entertain a motion to prohibit rentals at centennial grove for 2023 so moved second all those in favor aye 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 Do you want to talk about? Um... Yep. So municipal electricity aggregation. A number of towns in the area have taken this approach, where they actually work out a contract with an electricity supplier that residents of the community uh, can sign on to. So they'll say, "We've gotten a contract for, let's say, ten cents a kilowatt hour. I think that's what it is in Gloucester." And anyone in the community, as long as that contract exists, can sign on to that. Essex has not approached something like that, but every individual has always had the freedom to look at all of the alternative suppliers to National Grid for, I don't know, seven or eight years now, and find someone that they want to go with. The difference here is that if it's done by the, the town, Chances are we'll get like a three-year deal. Some of the things that you look at at National Grid, they'll give you six months, they'll give you a year, and you're always kind of catching up and, and hopping over things. The problem with this model right now is that if we went and tried to get a good rate with any supplier that's anywhere near um, a rate that someone wants to pay, we're not going to get it because prices are up right now doesn't mean I couldn't start the process of figuring out how we would do this for when the rate comes to a reasonable place. And is, you know, is that something you want me to start looking into? It'd be no sure, problem. Anything that saves sure. residents money makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Is it tricky? I mean... No, I don't think so. But it's, you'd be getting a, a longer term rate than an individual would, is what the benefit is. Correct. When you time the market right and yeah. you end up with something that's actually palatable. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start looking into that. I will entertain a motion to vote to accept the letter of resignation slash retirement from town clerk Pamela Thorne and consider the replacement process. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So that's for the resignation as far as the replacement process. So we have several months now. Fortunately, she gave you that much notice. And the question is, you know, do you want to start by looking perhaps in the town clerks association, getting something out there? What time frame do you want to start um, an interview process? You know, we could start collecting resumes and cover letters, and you could say, we're going to start looking at that in April, for example, just to try to see what, what you're getting and what's coming in before you determine 
whether you want to broaden it. As you know, a town clerk in Massachusetts is different than a town clerk in some other state. And so I think starting with their association is going to give you the best rounded candidates. And do you think April is necessary? Do you need that much time to get resumes, cover letters, and do interviews? I was going to say maybe do it earlier because but that you, seems you, like it would be a typical time for replacement of a town clerk and then you know, you're competing with everybody else if you could lock somebody in sooner. How much time do you want to give applicants? If, if it's two weeks, then you're starting this sometime in March. If it's four weeks, then you're starting it in April. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you think, I think. I mean, April's I, fine with me. I think April's good because it's going to give us time to really plan it out. Get, there might be a lead time for the advertisement, right. all of that. All right, I'll work on that. Uh, there's a couple of unanticipated items which can be set up for ratification at the next meeting. There was an earmark of an additional $20,000 for um, a, from the state legislature that would be expended for green infrastructure and climate resiliency projects in the town of Essex. <clears throat> I think that the board should put in that it would be money that you would spend on the Apple Street project because you may need miscellaneous um, money for legal fees, for surveying, I don't know what it's gonna be, but that certainly would be on target with a resiliency project. And I would like to write that in as the purpose, sure. which I can do after you sign it, but. Is that okay with the board? Yeah, as long as the legislature didn't have any directed. It's wide open. Shall be expended for green infrastructure and climate resiliency projects in the town of Essex. Okay. And in fact, part of the infrastructure in that project, which is that living retaining wall, is, a green, is actually green infrastructure. Correct. Um, so, so if you just sign that, and then we'll, we ratify it. Approve with ratification. This, this would be outside of the contract cost and, and, and so forth. This would right. be in case In cost. case there's a miscellaneous cost that comes up. Right, okay, yep. yeah, no, great. You'll have some freedom. I will um, entertain a motion to vote to approve the legislation earmark for $20,000 for green infrastructure and climate resiliency projects in the town of Essex to be ratified at our next meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then the other one is time sensitive. Um, for, from time to time, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is part of the federal government, um, renews their ability to perform perennial pepperweed project uh, eradic you know, they have a project to eradicate pepperweed. So they're going to various property owners in the Kenoma Point area, because that's primarily where the problem is, and they need this back uh, in close proximity to when you have your next meeting. So it's better to handle it now. There are four lots that are town owned and a number of other lots that are not. And the options are, and Peter, I know you've, you know a lot about this. I don't know which option you would prefer. And I should recuse myself from the vote because I benefit from okay. this potentially. Um, but haven't we used the herbicide yeah, or yeah, in yeah. the past, it's not just been all manual clearing. As, as long as as long as the um, property owner allows us to. You need in to this get... case, no. In this case, though, they're asking they're asking the town as a property owner oh, whether yeah. whether yeah. manual and herbicide could be used. Yes. Yeah. And so without getting into the project, you're saying herbicide yes. for pepperweed is not a harmful thing. Right. Okay. Yep. So if I check that off. Does, does the remainder of the board want to vote to sign this so we can get it back to them? Can I just read what it is? Yep, Thanks. we just got it today. But they're, they're going in front of the Conservation Commission only one day after your next meeting, and it would be probably too quick of a turnaround. So I will entertain a motion to allow the Fish and Wildlife Service permission to map perennial pepperweed on municipal property Nope. In that, these date, these right addresses. That's what they would be doing. 
on municipal property and control it using mechanical methods and herbicide treatment. And the maps and lots are there. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So that'll come back for ratification at your next meeting. And it's 8 o'clock. Ben, if you'd like to join us, you have a quorum, so if you want to join us and call to order, but it doesn't look like you have a full finance committee. I know Mike Flynn, I think, is going to dial in. Okay. And then there's three of us here, so we go to the quorum. Uh, I'm on the phone, guys. This is Mike Flynn. All right, Mike's there. Hi, Mike. And I see Mark Renzi as well. Yeah, Mark's here. Hi, guys. Hi there. How many do you do they have? The, I don't see Josh Franklin. Is he the only one you're no, missing? No, Josh. Josh said that he can't make it tonight. So, so Chairman Buttrick, I had a variety of things that the Board of Selectmen were going to talk about that are also relevant to the Finance Committee. If you want, I'll go down what they are, and then you can decide, you know, how we should take them. But you go. Ahead. All right, I, I'm going to enter, oh, go should ahead, I entertain a motion to for the Essex Finance Committee to go into session. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank so you. the things that I had would be, of course, the main, the main event is the uh, discussion of the operating and capital budget proposals for fiscal year 24. I also had the fact that the finance committee, I believe, is going to be meeting with officials from the Manchester Essex School, Regional School District on March 8th. Is that the case? We're, um, Teresa and I talked about this, and she's talked to Pam and Avi, so um, uh, we're waiting to hear back. Okay, to I only bring on it up that. because if you wanted the selectmen involved. It would be good to have the selectmen. That's so. a date to keep in mind, and yep. we would have to post. Then I have, um, we're going to discuss the wage and salary scale with the selectmen for FY24, and that involves certain requests for uh, increases in wages. There is the draft annual town meeting warrant, which I can go down through with the selectmen, and it will give the finance committee an opportunity to see everything that's on there when we talk about each one, and also the um, discussion about the turf field, the proposal for borrowing, and finally, um, the potential appointment of Jody Harris to the finance committee. This involves um, a board of selectmen vote but it also involves eventually a finance committee vote, which needs to be unanimous for Jody to continue to serve as on the Economic Development Committee, pursuant to the finance committee's bylaw. And I was hoping you'd have a quorum here tonight, but I'm sorry, a unanimous uh, a full, full compliment. Every member. You need com every member. Full compliment, okay. but you don't have them tonight. So that will be, we'll talk about that one last, I guess. Okay. So I guess want to start with the operating and capital budget proposals? Sure. Well, I can just start out by saying that um, so the Finance Committee has not yet finalized the fiscal 24 budgets just because members are still in the process of conversations with department heads. Uh, so that's ongoing. I will say that I don't think the headline is going to change all that much uh, as the defining element is the 8.96% increase in the Manchester Essex Regional School District uh, assessment to the towns and that number is specifically for the town of Essex. Uh, so this alone pushes us over the, if you look at fiscal 24, it pushes us over the 2.5% levy limit by 400 and as of today I guess uh, thanks to Jeff 457,000 just about 456,850 uh, over the levy limit which translates to about $736 uh, for the average single family house in the town. Uh, I will say that that's for fiscal 24. One of the things that we had talked about in past meetings is pre-funding fiscal years 25 and 26 for the district, uh, which because the district, well, they passed their budget on uh, February 7th, 
they have committed to not exceeding 3.5% in the assessment to both towns. So uh, what, what I was proposing is the 1% spread between the 2.5% levy limit and the 3.5% that they've committed to, and then factoring in the apportionment, which we know has been working against Essex. So that would be another 205,000 for those two fiscal years, which would, which would then put it up to 661,850. I still consider that to be an open discussion. Um, actually, I think it was Mike uh, last week at the FinCom meeting who brought up the fact of, well, could we absorb the hundred, you know, the, the, that amount per year for fiscal 25 and 26 uh, into our annual budget. I personally think that would be difficult because every year we, this town gets squeezed. Uh, and you're talking about the delta between the 456 and the 661. So in other words, if you only right. did an override for FY24, could you absorb the delta in the in the two out years? Right, spread out the the you know fiscal twenty five and yep. twenty six and absorb it into those years budgets. Uh, yeah. So I mean, you know, the question is, do we want to have a, uh, you know, a, a larger override this year, solve our problem for three years versus uh, versus just the amount of this year's uh, budget from the school? So that that is. My recommendation would be to do a three-year approach to this, but it would be more money. And was there also discussion at the Finance Committee about the, the Essex Tech Vocational District, which may also have a sizable increase, and whether or not that would be absorbed within the town's budget or a, uh, either a bundled or a separate override question for the tech? Our recommendation, we did talk about that, is to have separate... Uh, you know, separate override questions for each of those. So for the district, for the VOC. And, uh, and I know that'll play and into the warrant. Budget, then. Would it be a three year for the VOC as well? No. It would just be the single year. Yeah, because that, that. Right, because that, that the VOC one is really driven by uh, uh, an increase in headcount, and you might have some people graduate, and it could yeah. completely change next year. Now, one thing I want to point out to the board and to the finance committee is that if you went with the multi-year, the amount for a multi-year, you would then take, let's say, the 456000 that you need to complete the FY24 budget, and you would pay that to the school district in that first year. That delta, whatever the number is, 200000 whatever it is, um, would, go, would have to go into the town's stabilization fund for school apportionments, okay? The issue, and it may, may or may not be an issue, but the mechanics require that every single year after the first year, while the 456 isn't required to be spent only on the Manchester Essex Regional School District, the delta that you put into that particular account actually when it's raised in successive years plus plus its own two and a half percent has to go into that um, fund. stabilization fund mm -hmm. every year unless and until the town votes again at a town meeting with a companion ballot vote to change that situation the reason i go ahead no you go ahead okay no. so the reason i raise that is if you're counting on that money to balance the budget for the school district each year, the amount the town needs to produce, that is going to make the school district vote a two-thirds vote every year. Right, right. That's right. the but only it, reason it, I went through all that. It's only yeah. a two-thirds vote at town meeting. It would not be a ballot vote. You would never, you would only have a ballot vote in year one. Right, so it would be just like any time we remove money from a stabilization fund. That's a two-thirds right. vote. So, for so the, that's, that's simply what we'd be doing in 25 and 26. Right. In year one, you need two-thirds anyway for the you override. Two-thirds plus a ballot. Correct. Years two and three. You, you just need two-thirds at town meeting. But it's, it's a departure from the normal um, just needing a majority quantum of vote. Mm -hmm. right. right. And that may, may or may not be an issue for anyone. I just want to make sure everybody understood the mechanics because it's a change. And would the... Uh, 
the twenty-five thousand dollars we have, it's twenty-five, right? We currently I think we have put fifty in there and then didn't put any more in. I think 50? it's fifty thousand. So that would, right, that be, would that be applicable to this? Could could we in twenty-five and twenty-six use that fifty? So yes. we, we wouldn't have to put yes oh, shave yeah. fifty thousand off of the o off of, off the, of Jeff the has a, yeah so Ben have you or or Jeff have you sort of calculated w the delta in the tax bill for the typical home uh, the delta between doing it twenty four versus the th all three years well, yes. Yeah, It's 735 or 736 if we just do uh, 24, and it's 871 <clears throat> if we do 24, 25, and 26. So <clears throat> the difference is $135 to, to add those out here. But actually, as Brendan was speaking about this put, being forced to put money into the stabilization fund, you're talking about doing 200,000. But what, the way I'm hearing it is actually make it a hundred because in FY24 we had an extra hundred thousand dollars that would go into the uh, the stabilization fund. In year two we'd be required to do another hundred thousand dollars into the stabilization fund. The first year's contribution we paid for FY25. The second year's uh, contribution we paid for FY26. So you really only need to do a hundred in your override because that would be built into your year two so long as you can absorb the extra Oh, I see what you're saying, the levy. It, yeah. it, 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 it you're going to get that 100 twice. Capacity. You're going to get that 100 yeah. twice. And if you figure the 50, you know, maybe there's a way to knock that down to Right, like right. We could figure out the mathematical right. so, amount. Yeah. So that, that would work. Cut the difference down to you know, $60, something like that, by the time we get it all out. <clears throat> OK. So, so just getting back to the budget, I was just going to say, really, any tweaking we do to the, I mean, that's sort of an ongoing process. We talk to the department heads, we look at each line item, we, you know, we'll recommend some tweaks. It's not really gonna change the headline for fiscal 24, because this is the dominant factor, is, is the override. Um, uh, and that's, just, just one more question. So, yeah. to get enough money for even for FY24, because I know a few meetings have happened since the board last heard the, the amount. I believe that's now 8.96% increase yes. to Essex in FY24. Yeah. Okay. Just so everybody has the figure. And I think, Brendan, that number still needs to be validated. I think there are a number of good points that were brought up by some citizens in town during the finance committee that we're not 100% sure that that number is correct in terms of, yes, it's reflected correctly for the current discussions, but this reflects an issue that we consistently have had in terms of apportionment, meaning Essex portion goes up significantly more in the past couple of years, but we're still working through that math. So I think- But that's, that's the last you know, um, figure that the district provided to the town. Is that correct way exactly. of saying it? Yes. That's right. And also to Mark's point, I mean, you know, we know what the apportionment number is for fiscal year 24. We're estimating for 25 and 26 yeah. based on enrollment trends. So that's another caveat here. I mean, that. Uh, um, I, I would say for the selectmen, the select board, excuse me, um, that our understanding is, is that enrollment is going down, but the proportionality of Essex students is going up even despite the fact that enrollment's going down. And so it's created this trend of con over year over year consistently being much higher proportion of the increase going to Essex than to Manchester. Right. And Exactly, and I, I do also want to say, because we talked about this last week when we met, um, and that is that, uh, and this sort of flows into the March 8th uh, proposal of having yep. Pam and Avi attend, which they do the Manchester Finance Committee, um, and that is, they're, they're, in our discussion on, on Wednesday, there were 
concerns raised about some of the data requests, specifically around enrollment and also class sizes. And so I think it would be particularly helpful to have those addressed by Pam and Avi, um, you know, because there continues to be concerns and discussion around it. So, I mean, it's at the, you know, if, if I would not say right now that we have, you know, full support <laughs> for the dollar amount of the override right now on the finance committee. I mean, I know the budget has been passed by the school committee, but I also think there's more questions and discussion, which is, you know, we'll make that. So, so for the for the board's yeah, purposes, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's Mark. So, so just to put a finer point on it, but just, so there's almost a 9% increase to Essex. That's one. Two, enrollment is going down. Three, teacher headcount is going up. Four, we're being asked for an override. And then five, as Ben pointed out, the diligence requests combined between the FinCom in Essex and Manchester, those diligence requests have not been fulfilled in terms of trying to understand better why those prior four factors are, are happening. So I think we're concerned that our diligence requests are getting buried and it and um that's that's a concern broadly of the the finance committee in essex and i believe broadly in manchester but i i can personally only attest to one or two people there thank you so what i was going to say for the selectmen's purposes right now you're thinking that this is going to come about there's going to be a public meeting involving the finance committee and the regional school committee and you would also like to invite the selectmen on march 8th that's my hope but i i mean th this teresa and i talked about this on friday just as a as a follow-up to the finance committee meeting and i know she's talked to pam and avi about it so we're like we'd have to get it posted and communicated basically tomorrow okay so basically we'll wait to hear and then the selectmen if this meeting does come together you're interested in being posted for that meeting sure please so um, with, with respect to headcount, I know that the, the, this question has come up a num several times in our collaboration meetings, and, and it, it seems to me that if we're, if we're going to address this at an at a open meeting, it would behoove us, either the finance, probably the finance committee, to structure specific questions uh, or ask for specific information because the the uh, the administration has provided through various decks and and whatnot information related to uh, the their their if you want to call it justification of of, <coughs> of, of headcount and student teacher ratios how how they are moving over time and if 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 that information isn't sufficient, which apparently it isn't, then I think it would behoove us to really structure, you know, specific, this is the way we'd like to see it and, and get a, as an explanation. I not, totally agree. Not just have it. I totally agree. Yeah. We can do a, a Q and, I mean, we should provide all information that's already been provided heretofore yeah. and yeah. then uh, identify questions in advance. Right. Uh, you know, obviously there'll be yeah. a discussion that'll be organic, but I think that'll be helpful just so they they can have some time. Uh, just, just in terms yeah. of their the 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 way they approach, you know, bringing information to 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 this meeting. Right. It would be but it would be nice to have that. Mr. Selectman, Guy, it's it's Mark. So, I think on the face of it. Your, your premise makes sense. However, analysis done in real time is not a comprehensive nor a good approach in any commercial setting. So in other words, if we are in a, if we're missing lots of data and we're just going through it in a broad discussion format, that is not analysis. That is just, that is a problem. And, and I believe fundamentally that our data request as a finance committee, as in, in Essex and Manchester should be fulfilled prior to that discussion. And I think we'd be remiss 
because I will tell you from a commercial perspective, receiving numbers real time or, or discussion points real time, it does not make analytics you know, possible um, to be prepared for a meeting. So I think your spirit, the spirit of the select members, you know, point is correct. I mean, it's helpful, but we've been asking for this for quite some time. Ben can elaborate as to how long that time is, but I, I think it's problematic that we're not getting the information and in advance of meeting. Well, I think what we need are, are basically what has been provided heretofore and you know what we feel is not there and the the specific data requests that we've talked about and i know it's you know brendan brought it up at collaboration which was specifically you know by classroom by actual class because the averages you know what's underneath the averages is a lot of data in you know in terms of uh specifically around small classes so right and i know the superintendent told me a little bit after that that she does have the raw data but we don't have it yet we'd like to be able to run um, some charts on simply a column of data that shows each section title and a column that says how many students are in that section that's it that's all we're asking for right yeah we, we haven't seen it so and I did circle well, back think, a week ago I, I, requesting that same data again, and I still have not received a response to my email. Yeah, Brendan, I think I think it's just simple. I, I mean, we have increasing costs at eight, nine percent, somewhere in that you know perspective. We're asking for an override of our citizens, and I think Jeff's numbers are somewhere between seven hundred and eight hundred dollars you know, per person, uh, per household, excuse me. Um, we have declining enrollment and we have an increasing teacher headcount. So I think, I think in order for the select board to get comfortable that we've done our diligence, you have to ask yourself, are we actually functioning as a, you know, private school? I mean, are we, how do we reconcile you know, from the, the school board, those facts that were increasing costs to households by, you know, the dollar amount that was mentioned, a percent that's quite high, although we all know inflation has been tough, you know, and, but we still are faced with declining enrollment. And I think, you know, we want to get up there. We're supportive of our schools, but it also, we want to make sure that we can answer the questions as to, you know, how how are we in consistently increasing while we have a declining enrollment and why are teachers' headcounts increasing while we should maybe perhaps be consistent with, you know, cost um, relative to the enrollment. And it's just, I don't think... I don't think the finance committee can answer that those questions. And, and I know the select board... Yeah, so there's, there's a standing data request. I know that the chairman, who's the town CEO, has followed up and has asked again for that, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, do you have any more general budget? No, I was just going to say, just to close out that conversation, I mean, we are, I mean, the school has passed the budget. We are at the point in this process where it's around education to residents uh, in terms of what's behind those numbers. So I think the timing is very good to have this discussion um, uh, because, you know, to Mark's point, we have to be able to answer questions that people ask about where that money is going. So just to close it out. Okay. Um, moving into wage and salary scale, the Board of Selectmen is the personnel board, and normally they just approve for all non-union, non-contract positions a particular cost of living increase in this year would be 2% for most positions. We have had in the budget process a number of requests for uh, increases that are beyond that, and I have done some comps, provided some data to the selectmen, and I want to run down through that list. The first um, question is the stipend that goes to the fire chief. The fire chief makes about, I think it's like seven or 8,000 right now, plus the hourly wage for hours that he works. 
Um, it's very hard to find comps in our area because we're an all-call fire department with, an all, with a call chief. Um, one thing that I looked at was the building inspector's stipend of about 15 6 knowing that the fire chief actually comes into the fire station every single day, um, checks on things, gets work assignments done, uh, and then also goes to meetings, trainings, et cetera, at the hourly wage. But just the um, office work alone, it would seem that it would be better to move the fire chief up to something more akin to what the, the part-time building inspector makes as a stipend. That's about 15.6, and I don't know whether the selectmen have support for that or not, but it was a question that came to us, and that's where I would recommend it. Do you want us to vote on each one of these things individually? Yes, yeah, so that I can bring to you eventually a consolidated wage and salary scale that contains either the presence or the absence of these things that, that you may, may or may not vote on. Okay. Um, so I met with Chief Reader in regards to this as well and talked to him about as Brendan said, talk to him about kind of what he puts in for time. So he does go into the station seven days a week, checks emails, voicemails, responds to emails. He actually doesn't put in when he goes to regional dispatch meetings or other like chamber of commerce meetings. He actually doesn't put in for his hourly but he rate. Could. He could, but um, so he takes the chief stipend is just that to be the fire chief in anything that that involves. The only time he does put in for hourly is if he goes on an ambulance call or on a fire call. So I'm in support of the recommendation to increase them to the building inspector stipend. Agree. No, that's fine. So I'll entertain a motion to increase the uh, fire chief's stipend from the current rate to the building inspector stipend. I don't have the exact amount. It's 15,592. Yeah. Yep. It's on the, on the top uh, under fire. It has its own. Oh, I got it. 15592. That would be inclusive of the 2%. Okay. Next. So moved. So, so oh, moved. Sorry. Do we vote? All those? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I just ask sure. a quick question? Um, Jeff, are these recommended amounts rolled up in our budget? They are not. Okay. So, like, I just changed that now to match the building inspector. So, we'll do these kind of in real time. Okay. Yeah, and that's why I thought it would be great for everyone to hear it at the same time. Yep, no, this is helpful. Uh, with respect to the librarian, both last fiscal year and this fiscal year, the um, Board of Library Trustees has requested an increase in the librarian's hourly wage. They have provided comparables, but those comparables, by and large, last year were in communities where the librarian is a salaried employee, expected to get all the work done no matter how many hours the person has to put in. Our position involves being paid, I believe, 35 hours a week on an hourly basis without additional requirements. This year, comparables came in with respect to some other towns that they looked at more closely. And um, the issue there is the people that are in those positions that are driving those comparables right now have master's degrees. We do not require a master's degree, and the current person in the position does not have a master's degree. So based on the analysis of what we did last year, and again, what we've gone through this year, and, it, and even some of the comps this year are for large standalone libraries with larger staffs, and the librarian is actually man managing an entire building. I don't see, um, I, based on the fact that we don't require a master's degree and our person doesn't have a master's degree, I don't see that, that the wage that is offered right now is off, is off at all. In fact, if you took the wage we offer and you added 22% to it, which is roughly what a master's degree will get you, it brings it in line with, I think it's Georgetown, which was one of those comparables. Um, again, that person has a master's degree. So I think we're right we're right in line. Great. Uh, do you want a motion to take no action or just not vote on it? Um, since it was a request, I think you should vote to take no action, and it would be a 2% COLA. Okay, so um, under the position of librarian, I will entertain a motion to take no action. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Now, the building inspector's clerk, they're not asking for the wage and salary scale to be changed. They're asking for the clerk to go to the maximum in the existing range, which will be increased by 2%. Um, this request came in mid-fiscal year, and the, the personnel board at the time said, you weren't prepared to take mid-fiscal year changes, but you would like to see it come back so that on July 1st, this could possibly happen. My understanding is that there's already plenty of money in the existing budget, even if the person goes to the high end of the pay range. And again, this is not in an aberration from a 2% COLA being asked for here, so I do recommend it as of July 1st. I also think it's important to note that this employer works five hours a week, so this is not extensive. So I will entertain a motion to move the building inspector's clerk to the top of the pay range. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we have um, both the Council on Aging Outreach Coordinator and the Council on Aging Clerk are looking to move, the, the Council on Aging is looking to move those employees not to the top of the pay range, but actually to a higher level within the pay range. So again, this is not a request to change from a 2% addition to the bracket of those pay ranges. It's just moving somebody up and as long as they have budget to do so, which is we come back to the finance committee, then it seems completely reasonable. Again, these are part-time employees. So I will entertain a motion to move the Council on Aging Outreach Coordinator from 2053 current to 2219 per hour. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the clerk? I will entertain a motion to move the Council on Aging Clerk from 1530 to 1591 per hour. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The next is the town clerk, and although the current town clerk would not really benefit from this, she is suggesting that based on looking at her peers and what's being paid in the marketplace, the town, it would behoove the town to consider getting ready for a, uh, a higher salary. Um, the comparables that have been done certainly do bear out um, the fact that we're, I think, low when we, especially when we normalize the data, which the board asked me to do after the last meeting. And um, certainly I think it could be increased and you know, you could, you could increase both the lower part of the range and the higher part of the range or to leave maximum flexibility, you could keep the minimum pay where we have it now and incre increase the breadth of the range so that the top part of it is, is uh, something that would be used to competitively um, recruit the replacement. And the numbers there. I have them. You have them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have mine opened up. Go ahead. Any questions on that? No, no. So it make, I think it makes sense to keep the low range and go to the high range so that we have flexibility in case we end up with somebody with you know less experience than others. So I will entertain a motion to move the town clerk increase of annual sal salary from leave it at 55,348 and move the high end of the range to 75,500. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Now, another thing that we had a request about mid fiscal year was from the plumbing and gas inspector and the electrical inspector. Um, both of them stop what they're doing in their um, much more highly paid um, professional capacities as uh, electricians and plumbers, and they go to a, new, a number of town inspections for a very small stipend. Um, looking around at other communities, I would see a $10,000 stipend as a much better fit for each one of those positions. We had a working number of around $12,000. I think it's a little lower than that, but I can I can see anything between ten and twelve. Well, for each your 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 range, your averages were ninety seven hundred dollars, right? Yeah, close to that. And we were slightly different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess you know 
Yeah, the 10 seems reasonable. 10, 10's, I, I wouldn't go much above that. Okay. I will entertain a motion to approve the plumbing and gas inspector stipend from 6848 to $10,000 annually. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Then next, I suggest that our assistant plumbing and gas and electrical inspectors who have traditionally been paid nothing. Can you do this separate? Oh, I'll take the motion separate. Never mind. Go ahead. Okay. They've traditionally been paid nothing. What we do with our um, building inspector is that the assistant building inspector, which who, who puts in much less time, and that would be the case with our assistants in these other, these other departments, uh, is paid 10% of what the main inspector is paid. So my suggestion here would be to go from zero for these folks to 10% of what the full inspectors make. So that would be $1,000 each. So I'm going to take, I'm going to um, entertain a motion to approve the assistant electrical inspector from a zero stipend to a $1,000 per year stipend. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then Peter so on it. Are we allowed to ask a question, Ruth? Because I think Brendan framed it as a percent of, of the um, it, um, regular inspectors. Sure, salary. but if she starts it, it there, then year? it will grow in, in proportion every year thereafter. Right, and Mark, he did it based on 10% because we weren't sure if we were going to land at 10000 or 12000 on the plumbing and electrical. So had, in Got fact, it. we landed on the 12000 this would be a $1,200 stipend instead of a 1000 Got it, got it. Got it? And, okay. and Jeff, we've got this in the budget, right? Not yet. No, but We're, it's... He's it's, going to update the... Right, but it's minor oh, stuff. Yeah. It's minor stuff. Got it, got it. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. okay. Right. Um, Peter, I'm going to ask you to do the assistant plumbing and gas inspector. Okay. So I will entertain a motion to uh, increase or give a stipend of 10%, $1,000, to the assistant plumbing and gas inspectors. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm going to abstain from that vote. Thank you. I find that the building inspector stipend, if anything, is already generous based on the, the work that I did. And so the 10% of that for the assistant building inspector would be the same. So I recommend that you take no action on building an assistant building. I will entertain a motion to take no action on the assistant Building inspector and the building inspector. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Then the board has discussed from time to time over the last couple of years whether we should add something called a building field inspector. This would be somebody that would only go around the town and look for things that appear to be out of compliance, like a job is going on and they've already looked at the database and there's no permit. or a job is permitted, but they're looking at it, and it has not, no resemblance to what was permitted, that type of thing. Um, if you wanted to try that, we could add that in. You wouldn't have to hire anyone, but we could add it into the wage and salary scale. We would have to add a budget line, and you could start it at that $1,000 level, because it could also be a 10% mm -hmm. of the, I'm uh, sorry, it, no. the building inspector would be 10%, would be 1500 something. 1, So 15, 59. You're saying 10% of the building inspectors. Stipend. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay. So. And that's, I don't know if the finance committee has comments on that. It's, it doesn't exist. There's no budget line for it, but it would be a small step towards something. That's not what we laid out. We laid out the new position and you laid it out just the same as the assistant. What did I say here? Yeah. I, I, Equaling the assistant. Oh, okay. I think you got the wrong number. In there. Yeah, okay. Well, what would you want to see there? Because $10,000 is a lot more than... I agree. So I wasn't partial to that yeah. anyway, even though we... So yeah. I think that, I mean, getting it on the books with a number, I think is a good idea. But I was thinking somewhere more in the vicinity of the... Um, bear with me. Plumbing and gas. Where did we... of the 6848 that we were already working yeah. from with plumbing and uh, electrical. Mm -hmm. It's a new position. They, we don't have the, you know, specific job description. We don't know what they're going to do. I would like to see it 
closer to where that was. But you'd also like to see a budget line to make it real, right? Right, to make it real. So that's a question for the finance committee. So that's almost $7,000. Or we can start it at $1,000, like we did the it's, assistance, just to get it on the books. And see if somebody wants to get their feet wet and then revisit it. Okay. How's that sound? You're fine with that? $1,000? I'll let others comment if they... Jeff? Where do you envision the I mean, item going? Is it going to go under building inspector's budget? 1000 bucks. Just, just to see, and then you, you will have a title on the books. Okay, so I will entertain right, a motion to... A field... Field building. Field inspector. Field. Yeah, okay. Um, it seems to make sense. Is it necessary? So this, the field need? inspector was the position that we've discussed at a couple of meetings that we would have somebody that's right. an assistant to the building inspector right. that's actually driving around town with eyes right. on construction, things that the inspector is missing because he's sitting in the office sure. doing permits and yep. such. Um, so I will entertain a motion to add a $1,000 stipend to the field inspector building department, which is a new position. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Even if they do a one hour a week in a different section of the town, that's 20 bucks an hour, so. Yep. Harbor master. And Brendan, but, you confirmed that this happens in other towns, that there's something similar? In other towns, they actually have multiple assistants, and they have people that actually go around just for enforcement purposes. We don't have that function at all, and that's why the personnel board, the board of selectmen, has at several occasions discussed at least getting a start in that, um, in that vein. It's our minor attempt at enforcement, Mark. Yeah, no, no, I just... Uh, th there's there's all it makes sense but it, the question is is how much building pressure is there in Essex relative to the comparisons we've made but nonetheless we're not talking about a lot of money so and then the harbor master the comps for the small towns north of Boston really do not bear out that it requires an increase um, Right now, a request that, that the, the board can consider is that the part-time patrol officer in fiscal year 2024 will be up to $24.21. You could balance the request instead of going to 26, which is what was requested, keep the person at that patrol officer um, hourly wage, which is also the f called firefighter wage. Uh, right now, I think we pay 20, 2123. Yeah, 2123. So, you know, it, again, the comps didn't bear it out. At the same time, um, I can see bringing it up a little bit. Um, it's up to the board, really. I think the, the, the uh, position is fine where it is. Yeah, I I mean, if the comps, I feel like if we're going to treat departments by working with comps, we need to treat each department based on comps. So uh, it would be my recommendation that we, or I will entertain a motion to take no action at this time. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. And then I assume the same would be, if you're not adjusting the harbor master, you don't need to adjust the assistant harbor master, which is the last thing on our list. So I will entertain a motion to take no action on the assistant harbor master at this time. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Those were all the items. I'll put that together. The next item has to do with the financing for the turf field. Um, originally, the school committee had proposed to use district reserves to pay for the replacement of the two turf fields. There was a suggestion at one school, school committee meeting that the towns come up with the money for the turf fields and the school district would share back some of its reserves to reduce operating apportionments. That was proposed, but it was not something that the, the school committee uh, wanted to continue with. Um, after that, there was a suggestion made 
that perhaps the towns, the money could be borrowed rather than having it uh, come up with all, uh, all at once, especially since Manchester is looking at having to pay for half of one of the fields on its own, plus a larger share of the district's half and a larger share of the, dis of the district's cost on the, on the high school field. So Manchester would like to see borrowing as a tool because it may help them achieve their financial objectives. So if you look at borrowing, uh, at $1.2 million total, that doesn't include any project contingency, that's still going to require Essex to pay, I think it's coming up to toward 200,000. Um, I'm sorry. In the, in the interest, we were looking at a, a 100,000 on a $400,000 um, bill to Essex. And I think that's come down some because they were looking at a 5% coupon rate. Go ahead, Jeff. So on a five year, our interest would be 39,000. And on an eight year, it would be uh, just about 59,000. Okay, so 40 to $60,000 on a 300 and something thousand, almost $400,000. What is it? It's 403. 403, okay. Um, if the town of Essex already has the cash, which is what the original proposal was, there is a way to have a memorandum of agreement with the town of Manchester that would still allow Manchester to pay back the debt service to the district, and Essex could pay a lump sum to the district. Um, the question then becomes, and, and that would avoid all interest for the town of Essex, because it's still forty to 60000 on, on uh, the total, and that's without contingency. So it's actually a little higher than that. Um, the question then comes, given the fact that the district, although there's a bid price on the project, doesn't know what the final value of the project is going to be if contingency does have to be used, it would be better for the town to understand what the total cost of the project is after the project is done, because the project will start fairly soon and it will be done by, we think, September, which would give the town the ability to consider what the total price was in November and just pay the district the one lump sum. Whereas the proposal that came in was for the town to do the memorandum of agreement and pay some estimated amount to the district up front before the district incurs the debt. But the district doesn't have to have the town's commitment to incur debt. Yes, would it be a risk that the town would not eventually approve the money? Yes, and the only promise that the selectman can give is that you would put it on the warrant for November. You can't determine what the vote's gonna be. But if you did it that way, <laughs> given that the district does have the ability to incur debt without the town's backing, you would then know at the end of the project exactly what fall town meeting had to, had to appropriate. Is that a majority vote? That would be a majority vote. And so I went through kind of the history and the, and the options, and so I think the, there needs to be some discussion between the selectmen and the finance committee as to what your preference would be so that the district can be told what the town's preference is. Well, I can say that my preference would be the fall town meeting um, for a couple of reasons. One being what you just stated, Brandon, about that we would have actual visibility on what the final cost is or close to it. Secondly, is we're going to be having an override, an operational override vote in the spring town meeting and recognizing that the turf fields, what we're proposing here is a cash payment. It's not going to add to the tax. It's not going to act, add to the tax burden of residents. Um, but I think it would, this is purely from a political standpoint and not a financial standpoint, to separate it from the operational override, I think would be prudent. But, and and I, I invite other members of the finance. Right, so it would be, would be a twofold purpose is what you're saying. Yes. You know the number and it's not at the same time. Right. Nina, I know you have a question. If you can actually step up to the podium, just people can't hear you from the audience. Oh, I can make that appear. Or I can repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> so question with the fee. 
Fields, or Nina, do I have to say who I am? Just say your name so people that are joining us on the phone. Can Nina you? McKinnon, Finance Committee. Um, with the fields, I guess I think clarity needs to be made. I was at the meeting where Jeff had brought up the idea of the town being able to use monies as a one-time cost because there would not then, it would be one and done. You know, it wouldn't change our, I guess our tax base, move the benchmark. What is the school giving back? It seems like it's a take-take. If we're trying to maybe see if we're gonna promote an override, and we're helping to fund a, a cost that we've known of for three years. Has the Board of Selectmen, I, I know this came up in last week's meeting with the Finance Committee, but what is, it just seems like once again, the, how, do we, how do we message it that once again it doesn't seem like the school is just getting what they're asking for? Thank you. Chris? Is there, I don't really have a response, but I mean. Well, uh, I, yeah, I don't either. Because the Board of Selectmen hasn't discussed the fields. This is our first time discussing the fields. Are there any members of the Finance Committee that have dialed in that want to speak regarding the turf fields? Yeah, I, this is Mike Flynn. I'd like to just say something real quick. Um, you know, the encumbrance and the, you know, uh, the uh, cost, I, I personally think it's ridiculous to involve ourselves in a bond for something so small and something that's our share. You know, if we have the cash, it just seems like uh, it's just a cleaner, one time freeing ourselves uh, of this uh, obligation uh, rather than have a, you know, the hang bond situation with, you know, with our share of the underwriting costs and whatnot. So, thank you. Yeah, it's also, it's also my understanding. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Mike Flynn. Um, and, I mean, furthermore, you know, the allocation of costs between the towns, I know it's a little different for capital versus, you know, the the programming, but it just seems, it seems as if Essex, because of, it's just further away from the field, isn't getting the use out of that field the way you would if you lived next to it. Um, so I think to the extent that we can avoid taking on a, a bunch more cost debt is much more expensive now. I mean, I, I, I agree with where Mike's coming out, but I still do fundamentally believe we just unfortunately get less use of that field as Essex, um, literally because of proximity. Um, I guess what I would say to that, Mark, is we are district. We we are signed into a, a regional agreement. We are two member town district. So if the fields need to be replaced, it's Essex's responsibility as much as it is Manchester's to come up with our one third share to replace the fields. So I understand that we don't live across the street from it, but we do still have a responsibility to maintain it. And in addition, um, all the club sports um, use that those fields as well because they're joined Manchester Essex generally. So the soccer and um, whatever other teams play there um, use the fields as well, Mark. Yeah, no, I, I mean, look, totally get it. I've sat on the sidelines of that field many times. I, I just, I think we need to be looking at things closely in terms of how these costs are getting allocated, you know, and, and I think we're coming up against, you know, big capital expenditures or potentially Essex Elementary, which is really important. And this is, you know, my understanding is that the field is still okay, but I don't know how much longer it will be. But this is something we've talked about, you know, quite a few times and would like to see renewed commitment to making sure Essex Elementary is going to be fine when we need it especially as we're putting more capital into another town. So, so everything I've heard is the field is not okay. No, I think they've been limping the fields along yeah. um, for a few years to get them to this point where right. now they're, they're terminal. I thought I heard Mark say he, he, he thought. The, I think he did say it, but I think that. The, I would disagree with that. 
Yeah, I think that there's been an assessment of the fields done, and it's now at a critical juncture where they do need replacement. I, I mean, kids are getting hurt, Mark, with um, the yeah. turf patch it's, holes that they're doing. But I think that's, I agree, like, we shouldn't be letting people get hurt. I mean, that's for sure. I think, I think Mike's point is, is that do we need to incur incremental costs because of financing if we, um, and I, I don't know what Jeff's number is, but I heard it was, you know, I, I certainly at a 5% rate yep. versus using the, the, the ability to address it the way that Mike had suggested makes more sense. And I agree. So the number, the loan number was 403,000 and the interest was in the ballpark of 40 to 60,000. Um, so I will say I was um, privileged to a collaboration meeting on January 18th where the superintendent did say that the district had the funds in the reserves and that they had committed those funds to replacing the fields, that it is at a critical juncture, that the fields do need replacement, and that they were proceeding because it was the promise that they made to the members, uh, the two member town, the, more the, I think the families and the, the children of the district. So the money is there to have the fields replaced. I guess from what I'm hearing, it sounds like everyone's on the same page that the Board of Selectmen should make a recommendation to the school committee that we should be looking for an intermunicipal agreement asking if um, we can come back after the project's done, knowing what the full cost is, and uh, with a promissory that it's gonna go on the fall town meeting. Um, for appropriation, does is that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now the implication, though, is that as we would be paying in the fall, basically the district would have to float, likely vis a vis a vis the reserves, as you just stated, for the, you know, costing out of the work to be or the the actual yeah. initial payment. We do that with large grants all the time. The town we use the town's cash, and then we don't get the money back until the yeah. end. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I will entertain a motion that the Board of Selectmen should um, provide an intermunicipal agreement request to the school committee for consideration to pay the, um, to bring, to put an article on Fall Town Meeting to appropriate the funds for our share of the Highland Field. So move. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, and now I'm gonna move on to the um, draft town meeting warrant. The way we discussed it tonight, there would be two ballot questions on the top of the warrant, which is, serves as the town's election warrant. One would be a ballot question for um, supplemental money for the Manchester Essex Regional School District. The other would be supplemental money for the North Shore Agricultural Technical School District. Then um, at the beginning of the warrant, we would have some, we'd have the, uh, electing town officers elected by town meeting. Then we would have article two, receiving the town report. Then at article three, you could have the Manchester Essex School District supplemental question. And then after that, the regular Manchester Essex Regional School District budget article, which would give the ability for the town to still come up with a number within the town's levy limit if the override did not prove to be um, successful on the town meeting floor. So you, you could have a two part, two articles discussed together perhaps for Manchester Essex Regional School District, and then you could have two articles after that for the vocational school district. So, you know, I can change it to resemble that if that's what you sure. would like Separate me to do. Article three. Uh, Brendan, would the, um it, 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 in the failure of the first article, would it basically be two and a half percent? Yeah, there would have to be a number. We got to run all the numbers on it. Yeah. But there would be a way to say the town doesn't support this, but it supports that. Right. It could be two and a half percent, or it could be more than that if the town decides to use in that motion something that's represented by additional levy capacity. That would be more than two and a half percent. So where the number actually comes, I don't know. But this would be the ability to emerge from that meeting with something as opposed to everything was on one article that required an override, so everything went down. No. It would at least give the school committee something to consider. They may or may not agree with it, but it would be something to consider versus zero after town meeting okay. if, if it's not successful. Okay. So that was, uh, and, and we're taking that 
example that model from the last time this was done, which was in 2005, where there was a piece that was, here's what we're look, looking for for the override, and here's what we're looking for in the regular article. Now, at that time, it was a bundled article that included vocational district, Manchester Essex district, and some money for the town at the time, for this, the town's operating budget. We've already looked over the request for the town's operating budget for FY24, and we're below two and a half already with that. And so the question then comes, you've got the two school districts, and I think I'm hearing that you want to separate the two because the reasons behind them are different. So, uh, but on, it, only the second half of that, the override, would be subject to the ballot. Correct. The two and a half. Right, and, and, and both questions will appear on the ballot whether or not they pass at town meeting, and there will be a vote at the ballot whether or not they pass at town meeting. And if they happen to pass at the ballot, you can come back and have another town meeting to try again for the town meeting piece because it's a two-part process. Two-part meaning? You need both votes, vote. ballot town and town meeting vote. For, for both parts? Part or the override portion only. The old, old yeah. Override portion yeah. only, right. Mm -hmm. Brendan, does the ballot vote happen before the town meeting or after? after. No, it happens one week later. After. One week later. Okay, yep. got it. So then uh, we would look at the wage and salary scale. That's a usual article. We, are, we covered how that's going to look. There is the, um, also the elected officials on the wage and salary scale. Then we go to the repayment of the town septic betterment fund. We have that every year. Then we move into the town's general budget article that the finance committee speaks on. Uh, then the sewer enterprise fund, if we have any additions for the remainder of 2023 using sewer free cash. The next article would be sewer enterprise fund for FY24. Then we'd do the same pairing for water, if there are any 23 costs, and then water for 24. The school district budget, each of the school district budgets will have already been covered up above, paired with their companion override articles. Go ahead. Article. Oh, it's just, it. it's just, just a typo. typo. Yeah, yeah, just typo. Okay, so article, af after we get through the budget stuff, um, there, there's been a request, and I think it's coming through ma you, Madam Chair, to potentially move the uh, finance committee membership from seven down to five. Conservation Commission. I'm sorry. What did I say? Okay. Finance. finance. That's okay. Not the finance committee meeting. They actually have their own bylaw that allows them to do a sliding quorum. The, the Conservation Commission under state law can be from three to seven. This would be a, a request to put it right in the middle. I don't know if you have anything else. Maybe you got that from the chairman. Or I did get it from one of the co-chairs. Um, the Conservation Commission has actually had several quorum issues lately. And given that the Conservation Commission, being in Essex and surrounded by water, when they don't have a quorum, they have to cancel the meeting. And it's we're finding that they're running into a lot of problems with approving of building permits and public hearings and so on and so forth. So this has been an ongoing problem for probably close to a year now, where they're having to cancel meetings and postpone them and then people aren't able to move forward with their projects. So they were requesting to go from seven members to five to make the quorum more uh, achievable. So that I've got that on there. Then two articles from then, we're gonna talk about a complete reorganization of the zoning bylaw, no substantive changes in that particular article, just to get the zoning bylaw ready so that when we get to the fall town meeting, people have had the time in between to digest a much more user-friendly version of the zoning bylaws. Just prior to that, though, the chairman of the planning board wants an article that would allow for minor corrections, and then those would show up in the reorganization. For instance, we have a spelling that should be principal P-A-L, and it's spelled P-L-E. Um, we have um, a typo that, that talks about uh, a, something being in the negative when we know it was actually intended to be in the affirmative, minor things. So there might be a handful of minor things so people can see that these are the only changes. We're not bundling them with the, the wholesale reorganization. 
And then we go to the reorganization article. After that, the board wants to consider, and I did ask town council about the order, and he really feels that you should consider the increase of the hotel motel excise tax or local tax from 4% up to the state maximum of 6% as the first article in this, in this series, which would bring more revenue, non-tax revenue to the town, property tax revenue. Do you have any data on that, Brendan, in terms yeah, of Jeff, the- Yeah, uh, Jeff does. It's, um, I don't know if we have it handy though. The excise, I'm sorry, the hotel motel tax data, um, which is partially coming from short-term rentals and partially coming from, I think, one motel. It was it was roughly comparable. Like yeah, I mean, it, was, it, was pretty it was like all short term was roughly equal to the one motel, and so the the order of magnitude, Jeff, was like fifteen, yeah, fifteen thousand. So this would be two percent on that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we weren't like an outlier uh, in terms of other communities, it, like you know. Um, seasonal communities that uh, attract a population that you know may may increase in the or they're um, presumably short-term rentals in the summer yeah and, and so example, this proposal this proposal would would take since the hotel motel tax applies to both short-term rentals and hotels motels this would give put two percent on all of that mm -hmm. then there are two other articles that would come after that that would have the town consider whether short, just the short-term uh, rental industry would have an additional 3% uh, tacked on top of that. So for those short-term rentals, if the 6% passed, they would end up at 9% or any number in between, up to 3%. Um, it's called a community impact fee and the way town council has this structured and the way DOR wants this thing addressed, it really has to, has to go in two articles because it's one portion or one subset of short-term rentals and then another portion that's a different configuration of short-term rentals. What the selectmen are trying to do is to imp impose this impact fee on both sets. So if, again, if it passes at 6%, and this passes at one, it would be a total of seven, or it would be eight, or it could be up to nine, depending on what the town wants to do. Then we have another article about um, getting the town meeting to approve duration of contracts for transfer station management slash waste hauling and for the actual disposal at Covanta for a time period that's longer than three years. Right now we're proposing five years. The selectmen can do contracts for up to three years, but they need town meeting approval to sign a contract that is over three years. So that's why that article's there. The next article is the town voting not only on what the increase to the sticker will be for the use of the transfer station, it'll also be voting on what the cost of either a small pay-as-you-throw trash bag will be versus a large pay-as-you-throw trash bag. The Board of Public Works will be coming to meet with the selectmen at the next meeting to discuss the um, cost of the sticker versus the cost of the bags. Now that we have um, our contract numbers known, we can put that together for the board. But instead of just changing the sticker fee at this article, we're talking about a sticker fee and a bag fee. Article 21, I know we're not complete on this, right. but a lot of these hires are going to go to lower in increases. Are going to yeah, go yeah, to okay. In the yeah. second sticker, so just be aware. Um, yeah. The second sticker fee was decided unan unanimously against, so some of that's going to go. Right, yep. Got it. Okay. Then, um, to guard against unintended consequences, it's possible that. Go ahead. That's actually not going to say Board of Public Works. It's going to be Board of Health. Right. So I put an idea on here for a, a bylaw that would regulate private trash haulers because if a lot of people decide not to pay the town's fees, they might bring in a private trash hauler. Well, then you're going to lose that revenue. Mm -hmm. And so a regulation 
that would at least ca recapture some of that. Instead of a bylaw, the Board of Health has agreed, and they can through their public health bylaw process, to have that regulation put in place. And that would require each hauler to pay the town a certain amount of money to do business in Essex. So you'd start to recapture some of the revenue that you might lose to private companies. And you could also use this to set up procedures for these haulers, what yes, they feel, yeah. how it's timing the, and The rules they... plus any fees. And it was more about the rules and not so much about the fees. It's right. more about the times, the noise, the disposal, right. um, you know, the the new Cycling, the textiles yeah. law, making sure that those things are captured. Got it. Got it. I mean, the yeah. fee is also a part of it. But so, so part of the issue around this is obviously the enforcement of the sticker. And I know that this has come up. But if we're relying on potentially a smaller pool of people who purchase the sticker because some of them presumably may be going to private haulers, then we just have to be really careful. Uh, and I guess part of it, this is a question, and I know we're talking about the warrant, so it's not yeah. a debate, but uh, around the enforcement of the yes. sticker. Which yes, will and probably come up on but the floor. It probably will, but that's one of the articles. When we're looking to consider the management, the contract that we just signed this evening with Commonwealth, they are going to be doing management of the station. With a very so, detailed work uh, plan. With that's the work in the plan. Contract. Yes, we have two pages of work plan that's right. very specific. Yep. Right. Uh, the next article has to do with the fact that whether the town is given easements for the Apple Street project by people who want to willingly give them their roadside easement for the project, or people are saying, I'll give you an easement, but I want to negotiate a price with you, or people who don't want to talk to us at all and the town has to consider eminent domain, domain this article would handle all of those eventualities. Uh, question for the board, we're starting to hear from some people and we have some people wanting to have the board vet some ideas, which since it's a, a real property discussion, I'd like to have that in executive session at the next meeting and put it on the agenda if, if you're so inclined. I'm inclined. Yeah. Then we have an article for um, a long-term contract with a summer camp and youth and adult enrichment services provider. Right now, that's the YMCA. They're coming off of a 10-year contract that was approved by town meeting. That's after they did a three-year contract as a trial 13 years ago. And the Board of Selectmen has decided that we're probably looking at a five-year contract. And it may not be the YMCA. They'll have to compete for it like they did before. But we need an article that goes beyond the standard three years. And that's the purpose of that article. New copy machine for town hall is the next one. That's been on the capital plan for several years. Um, Historical Commission had an article for historic uh, property surveys. Since they can no longer get that through the Community Preservation Fund, it's no longer eligible. The town meeting indefinitely postponed that, but the selectmen felt they were asked and they felt like it's something that the town meeting could consider again. We know that the commission is changing membership, and we know that the new chair would like an opportunity to speak about it at town meeting. The um, next would be the bulletproof vest for the police department. It would be an amount of money sufficient to purchase the entire um, cost or to support the entire cost of the vests. And then if we get a grant, it would be after the fact. And so if you get that money back, great but we can't bank on the grant, so it will be for the entire cost. And the grant is for 50%. Yeah, yeah, half back. Then we have um, an article for um, the fire department has just gone for a federal grant. Now, Ruth, you, you mentioned that it's for a tank or truck and radios and one more thing. And there was a third thing, and Ramey did not know. I don't know what which, the third thing is. I don't either, is. so right, we'll I'll get, get that. that. But the okay. tanker truck is um, upwards of a million dollars, and this is a grant that we would potentially get 95% of that yeah, covered. It would be a 5% match. It would be a 5% match. So that's on there. Then I have a question. Um, if a match is required, we're going forward with the 
small town, small and rural town grant that will help um, modernize the Centennial Grove, improve the facilities, et cetera. I don't believe that there's an outright match, but I know that it will sweeten the pot if the town does put some money in. I'm wondering if we should at least add a placeholder article for a match to that grant. And as we develop the application, we could find, yeah, if you give 10%, your application is probably going to be looked at better than the person who wants 100% funding. What do you think the range is? I think 10%, I think 10 would be a well, good what faith. What would that translate into? Uh, on a, on a $400,000 project, okay, so 40, 40 grand. grand. Yeah. So is it something that I can add, at least sure. for discussion? Yeah, sure. I think yeah. it's worth putting an article on. All right. There's enough people in support of it. Um, OK, cemetery mapping software, Jeff. Um, my understanding is that you were in discussions with the DPW on that, and that, in fact, they might want a chance to get on the town's permitting software instead of cemetery mapping software. But I don't know where that ended up. So right now, is the Finance Committee wanting the selectmen to put an article on for cemetery mapping software? Sorry, Ben. I don't think we have it in there. Um, ben, what is, could you just explain that, what that exactly means? Yeah, um, I think it was $25,000, and it's the Department of Public Works, rather than relying on a semi-antiquated way of managing the cemetery if they map it out they have a they have a much better um view of not only graves that are um, fully occupied if you will but also graves that have been purchased but not utilized wow sorry <laughs> so well this was some of my questions i wanted to know if this was going to plot every grave was this going to help locate graves and is it going to help them dig graves so is this going to um, become are we finding efficiencies? Is this going to increase um, their ability to do it so it decreases labor costs and things like that? My is understanding is that it's mostly for better management of, but that's all the information I have. Jeff, did they provide any supplemental um, memo or? And I know from speaking with them that they still would like it considered this year. Now, you could easily just say, we want to study that more, and I'll tell them maybe next year, because I think you need more information as to what it's going to do. And I don't think we have that level of information yet. Well, that's what I, we need, like an ROI, basically. Right. You know, on the, the 25K is not chump change. Well, let me see what they can put together, and we'll go from there. Because we don't have it as an article, just an idea right now. Um, Brendan, Brendan yeah. is there viewed, and this is, is there viewed that we have a lot of capacity? Was that I mean, just, and those are the sort of questions. Like when we, when we get back to it, to Ben's point. Right. How much remaining capacity is there in the cemetery? That type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, if we were before. I've never dealt with this, just to be honest. But um, if we're 90% full, or and we only have 10% to go, I mean, you know, those those sort of questions are yeah. however it's measured. Yeah, it'd be good to dimensionalize it before we spend. Yep, you know. I will uh, work with them on getting more information, and it's also something you could consider for the fall or even next year. Um, yeah. The turf field uh, is going to be in the fall. Um, the commitment of the selectmen is to uh, bring a known number to the town in the fall. The additional money for renovation and maintenance of landscaping in the downtown public areas, this comes through the Economic Development Committee. They feel that the 20000 that was approved in the fall will probably get the spring spruce up done, and it will get some things reset in accordance with the town's placemaking plan and plant palette that's being worked on right now. But that when it comes to actually maintain these things, 
after the, the spring install, if you will, we need more money, like a like amount of money, perhaps 20,000 more. That's a request that's come from the Economic Development Committee. Is that something you want an article for? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Now, it's on your agenda. We might as well talk about it now. We've had somebody, there are two people out on Robbins Island who bought the, the lot that the house is on from the town. But their garages have always been across the street on Robbins Island. And since there is a public access point that the town carved out when the subdivision was done, it was thought that perhaps those two lots that have the garages could serve as public parking in the future. The garages could come down and the year-to-year -year leases for those um, parcels could be extinguished. I have not seen too, too many people clamoring to get out to this public access point on Robbins Island. It was kind of put aside when, when the whole planning was done. And that doesn't mean that, this, that the town's right-of-way and access point will go away. That's not in question. It's just whether or not somebody wanted convenient parking. You could certainly park anywhere else on the point and walk out to Robbins Island and then go out to this, this access point. You could do it today because it's, it's a separate lot. And so the person who is asking the question is saying, we need to do some repairs to our garage. We want to put a new roof on it. But we'd rather not do that if we don't know whether we'll have the garage more than a year. And so the question is, should we put an article on town meeting? If you're going to do it for the one, you might as well do it for the other to see if the town wants to part with those properties and sell them at fair market value to each of the current tenants, which could be done to those people because we have special legislation allowing lots to be sold to the current tenant. Do they need to remain as garages or they could, could they be houses? You would, you would want to control that. You would yeah. want to say no to that. And so, yep, you get a deed, you pay us this much money, but the deed carries a restriction. And that limits the price. Limits the price. Yeah. Do you want an, an article for those two lots on the warrant, or do you want to take it up some other time? So I went out this weekend, and I just kind of surveyed the situation at 44 Robbins Island. Um, and looked at the garage across the street from the house. Is this second one? So when the two lots was here, I highlighted it and said, who else? Because I was unaware of the second. Is it the one to the, if you're looking the at them to the right? If you're looking at them, I think it's. The little one there. It's this, yeah. it's this one. Because it's okay. lot 15.2, which is the person who called or wrote to right. us. And lot 15.1, which goes with this one. Okay. Now, is this person asked? No, but if you're going to do it, yeah. if you're going to give up the need for public parking, then right. you might as well sell both of them. Right. If you want the town's plan of potential public parking in the future to continue. I just don't see public parking down there. I don't, After I having don't gone see the, down there and walking around, I don't see somebody driving down that little neck of the road to park in front of people's the, houses. The town lot what? is is on there. It's a little winding. You, you all yeah, saw it, right? Little narrow strip. It's this little narrow strip on the corner of the road. And then you widen out to a place right here where you could access the clam is flats. This, or, is this yeah. town property here? Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, I guess the question is, I mean, look, Ruth, I, I've driven down there too. Um, it's hard to turn around. Right. Number one. And then number two, it's, it is very pretty there. And number three, like we, we have the spirit of, you know, there, there is there is a waterman spirit and to the extent that i mean it's not going to be we're not going to get a lot of money off of lots that have a lot of restriction that's one and two you you, you know it seems to me the, the you don't go down there because you really can't turn around easily if you have a spot and the waterman could use it and that i mean that keeps in the it keeps I mean, to me, it keeps in the spirit of this town. I mean, I've been here 20 years, you know, for the watermen to have access to another spot and instead of a fancy garage. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not, not faulting anybody for wanting one, but I do think there's tough access as, as our, 
as is. And maybe it's good over there. I don't know. It would be good to hear from, you know, the shellfish warden or see if that's a good spot too. I, I don't I don't know all those things, but so you're advocating like for taking the two garage to not renew the two leases of the two garages and turning it into municipal parking. Yeah, or access for the town to use. Yeah, the access is already there, Mark. There's a path and an access point. It's just not accessible unless you park somewhere else and walk out on Robbins Island Road. Well, I just am trying to think of it from the spirit of what this our town is. I'm not saying like, I mean, do, would the watermen use that? Is that something that we want to, you know, consider? And I don't know the answer to that. Just suggesting process. So I guess. And I don't. I don't know that we're going to make a lot of money from selling a lot that can only have a, a garage. What would the cost be, estimate, Brendan? Do you think to turn two garage area into parking lot? Two demos, they're gonna cost, they're just garages, they're gonna cost you 10,000 a piece, so that's 20 grand once you take it over. Um, and they did, if they don't contest that they own the structure, it would be great if they did say that they own the structure because their sole remedy would be to take it away, which they're not gonna do. So you're gonna end up with two properties um, at 10 grand a piece just to get the structures gone. And then you're gonna have to go through permitting with the Conservation Commission to change the use from a pre-existing garage use to a parking facility that would accommodate multiple cars basically in the middle of the wetlands. So I'm not saying that it's, it's easy, even if you wanted to go with Mark's suggestion, I'm not even saying that you could get too many cars in there, there might be restrictions, I don't know. It's also something you could say, let's consider that in the fall because you might want to really well, talk to people well, and consider it. Why don't we let the town decide? You certainly can. Or we can we yeah. could table this until the next meeting and we can let the selectmen go out and actually look at the parcels and the size and the structures. I know I went out this weekend and yeah. I was only focused on the one okay. and walked yeah. around I'll, it. I'll go out and look so at I'll, I'll do a maybe on this and we'll bring it back up at your next meeting. Let's bring it yeah, at the next meeting. Without knowing, without is it, seeing is it at it. the Canoma Point Road end? It's or at the Robbins far end? Island, so you go, yeah. you it's take really the left, and you go all the way down, and I mean, it was tight. I did a three-point turn to turn around. Yeah, we have a map. Oh great! It floods That's Robbins then. Island. You know, the, the yellow one is the people is the person that wrote us. That's the garage lot, and you can see the the weird shaped lot that goes out to the marsh, a little alleyway. That's the town's access point. Mm. I mean, it may as well just be a shared driveway. In a in a easy. Yeah, how many cars I mean, can you fit in there? That's part of that. Very few. Well, in the lot, well, if we remove the structures with the corner, still got to maneuver and you get, this yeah. and that. So, all right. Well, we'll bring it back up. We'll bring that. We'll table it. So then, um, but Fred, just a quick yeah. question, procedurally, if they own the structure, and we say, you know, we don't want to renew it, don't they have to take it down? Not on the they, that's side. their sole that's their sole remedy if they want it, but they don't have to take it down because what happens under the court um, decisions that we got in 2013 is that in a case where a structure is not permanently affixed, that is, it's maybe on posts or pilings, probably like these are, at the end of the lease, the structure becomes property of the town. If they got make it. an argument I that it's not permanently affixed, their sole remedy is to take it with them. But if they don't, it becomes ours. If they make an argument that it is permanently affixed, then it's already the towns. And again, becomes the towns at the end of the lease. So it's our problem to deal with unless somebody says, I want to take it away, which nobody's going to do. Well, Brendan, could I, I mean, let's just, let's put it simply, if we decide not to take them down and take them back as the town and make parking. Can I bid on them? Can any citizens bid on citizen of the town bid on them? We have we have special legislation that would allow the selectmen to offer it only to the tenants, but that does not have to be exercised. So if the selectmen decided, yes, we want to sell these, but we're not going to follow that right of first refusal, we're going to do standard procurement. Yes. But that would be a policy decision on their part. Got, got it. Okay. 
I mean, I don't know what I'd do with a building. You can only park cars in in the middle of a flood zone, as you on the wetlands, as you said. But nonetheless, you just you know maybe that helps with getting a higher value if you make it competitive. Yep, and I've got a bridge to talk to me after. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got Article Twenty Nine or whatever is going to be renumbered to with uh, more. Uh, sewer grinder replacement work that would be utilizing sewer enterprise free cash. Then we have an article for the municipal water system, which would be, I believe, the water department wants some meter reading equipment that it gets attached to meters out on Kenoma Point to make the reading easier. That would be water free cash. We have an article for more money for green crab trapping that would supplement what we usually get in grants. And that's typically been 10,000 bucks, 12,000 bucks, whatever. If we don't get that, if, yeah. if we don't get the, the state allotment, then this would go away. We would put it back into- uh, If you don't get the state allotment, you could come up with money on your own, but it's not matching anything. It's right, not leveraging right, anything. Right. Yeah, so you could, you could indefinitely postpone it. Yeah. So on the Kenoma Point water meters, um, do we have information about that? I'm curious, currently we flat rate their water usage and I know a lot of them have gorgeous green lawns. Will these meters then be able to be read to charge them that's, fair market value of what they're using? That's part of their thought, yes. Because there's been a debate at the Board of Public Works as to whether, you know, what's the best way to go with that. Article, the next article is Community Preservation Act funding. Right now, the only thing that I know that's hanging out there is the Affordable Housing Trust would probably want to approach the Community Preservation Committee to try to get some money transferred from the Community Preservation Fund for Housing to the trust's actual account. And then once money is transferred to the trust, they can spend it without further appropriation by town meeting. I know of no other CPA requests except for the standard appropriations uh, at this time. Um, then we have, in case there are changes to operational expenses for FY23 to modify the budget, right now we know that we're going to need, I think it's $10,000 to pay the bag manufacturer up front for the first order of bags in fiscal year 23. So we will probably modify the FY23 budget in this article. I don't know of any other things we need to do, but we have the ability to. It's a very generic article. And then we would have that order money, because on May 2nd, we're going to want to place that order, because there's a long lead time on the bags. And it's a July 1 kickoff. Uh, then a uh, Finance Committee's Reserve Fund, if for some reason you want to increase it for the remainder of fiscal 23, you would do it there. That would give you basically two months to spend the extra money. And then unpaid bills from past fiscal years, I'm already aware of one, there may be others. That's it. And so I'll go over this warrant again and bring it back to the board. And then I have one other thing for the Finance Committee, which is there is a recommendation from the committee to appoint Jody Harris to the Finance Committee for a partial three-year term ending 6-30-25. The selectmen can vote to do that, but if they vote to do that without a un unanimous vote of both the selectmen and the Finance Committee to allow Ms. Harris to continue her work on the Economic Development Committee, she's currently the chair, then she can't stay on it. And I don't, is there any way for you to, do you have everybody except Josh? Everybody except Josh. Any way to get him on the phone? <laughs> Nina, do you want to text him? Because if you can get okay. everyone here to consider that question, the selectman's appointment will have less, uh, less questions behind it. Because it would be contingent upon us make, taking that vote. Both the and we have yeah. to, we have to basically take a vote to acknowledge the other committee. It would be role. somebody on your committee on that's serving on a separate committee. Right. And that vote has to, has to actually come from the selectmen unanimously and the finance committee unanimously. So the procedure would be the selectmen would vote to appoint, possibly, Ms. Harris. 
And so there it is, there's the appointment. And then there would be a separate vote of the selectmen to say, do we unanimously support her staying on the other committee? Then the finance committee would take the same vote. And if that was unanimous, she's on your committee and she could serve on both. Okay. Would the economic development committee need to vote too? No, uh, the bylaw for the finance committee requires- Oh, uh, it's only the, the finance. Yeah, it's in the bylaw. We have a, a, a history of having cross no. membership. In no, we, we only have from time to time like a liaison from the finance committee to some other group, but, we have but no. they're not a member of the committee. Right, but, but there's no. We have had, I think, I think we had somebody on strategic planning, but it's not a, um, it was like an ad hoc committee and you know, the worst case scenario would be someone says, well, you can't be on that anymore. This is a much more substantive situation. Why is the, uh, is the finance committee looking to get bigger? Is that the idea? Well, we have seven open, or we have seven seats. We have six filled. So um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask Brendan also is if our quorum requirement goes from, right now it's four, four members out of six filled seats. Does that go to five? Our oh, I'm sorry, you can say that again. Sorry, I'm just wondering for a quorum, I know it's a sliding scale for the finance committee. Yep. If we have all seven seats filled, does our quorum go from four to five? Yeah. Um, I just don't. No, 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 four. No, no it stays at four, I'm sorry. It stays at four, okay. So where did, where did we leave the Robbins Island Road? Table till the next table. Meeting. So that you can go on and look we at can it. Go look at it. Yeah, okay. And we're looking at both properties. Yeah, I haven't. So we can't get it. All right, so I don't know whether you want to make the appointment. If you make the appointment, it's kind of hanging out there. Um, well, what we could do is, I mean, we're looking to set up this meeting next week. Yeah, okay. And so we can just push it to next week. Well, why don't you say and that... Actually, if it's a joint meeting with the Board of Select, yeah. then we could do it all. And you could, you could do it then, if yeah. you don't mind waiting a few more days. If I'm not available next week, can I say that I can actually go No, no. it all has to be at once. <laughs> so can we vote and then they vote separately? You, you could vote now to appoint Ms. Harris with an effective date of March 8th and then see what happens. But if Nina already knows she's not going to make the March yeah, 8th, we have not. that same problem. Yeah. Can we make it contingent upon Finance Committee unanimous approval? Is that whenever they vote? Well, whenever. Yeah, I would say so. Sure. Why okay. Don't we do that? Sure. Do that. That's a good idea. So I will entertain a motion to consider the appointment of Jody Harris to the Essex Finance Committee for a partial three year term ending 6 30 2025. I'll stop there and do the second piece. Um, contingent upon finance committee vote. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I will entertain a motion to um, continue to allow Jody Harris to serve as the chair of the Economic Development Committee, contingent upon the finance committee unanimous vote. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I just wanted to mention to the board, so that, that's everything I had that was finance committee related. Thank you for your patience. Um, with respect to uh, the property at 31 Apple, go ahead. Should we adjourn? Sure. Yeah, sure. All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the Essex Finance Committee. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, um, Finance Committee. Have a great night. All right, thank you. So the town has a right of first refusal on 31 Apple Street, just like it's exercising on 30 Apple Street. And um, I got a call from the buyer of 31 just to say that if the board wanted to talk to the buyer about any ideas that it might have, they're open to doing so. And I know we had when 30 Apple Street was 
purchased. I know you have the developers in. I don't know that you have any specific ideas, and I don't know, you know, where that's going to go, but I just wanted to point that out to you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's see. We, I know we don't need to do this with the Finance Committee, but you usually do this as part of the annual draft warrant, and I had comments for the next tiers. Do you want to do that now? Sure. sure. Okay. So, so Ruth has some comments on the, the, an, the second page of the two-page. Tier two? Um, it's actually not even tier two, it's third tier. I dig that out. Do I have that? Yeah, it should be in the package. Was it in this new package? Yeah, it was yeah. in this new yeah, package. Yeah, it was. Mine too. I can also just give you mine with my notes. It. It's got to be in this one. You can look on mine. We'll look at see they're, if I have they're any not comments. Big deal comments. Just we usually go over it. So second page, third tier, um, possible hiring of half time town planner to assist the planning board. I circle that and just wrote done beside it because I feel like Dana is going to be very instrumental. So I don't think we need to worry about yeah. hiring somebody. So, so just so take it off. Take it off. Yeah. Um, I don't know if now is the time to talk about fall town meeting, but there's the replacement of the police department truck with a new vehicle. Um, I'd like to see the fleet actually decreased, not replaced. So I would like to remove that, but I guess I, I whether now is the time and place or we want to just leave that and talk about it in the future is up to the board. Well, this is an ongoing list. I think if, if the board agrees now that you're not looking to replace the truck, it should come off of those. So how does the board feel about that? So the pickup truck was, yeah. originally purchased for as a harbor master vehicle and they no longer fall into police yep i'm fine I can leave it up um under long range potential items the very first one which is active in 2020 was the construction of the new crosswalks on martin street that was brought to us by a resident with concerns after a motor vehicle accident if you recall we did receive a quote of eighty thousand dollars i'm sure with the cost of everything that's probably gone up i'm not sure that the town is going to justify eighty plus thousand dollars for two crosswalks i don't know how the board feels about removing that it's kind of taking that place for a while or if you just want to leave it it's I leaving it on leave, the paper is fine it. but I okay leave it. it's long range um active this one I have a question mark beside it, not because I want to remove it, but because I would like to actually see how we can continue to work forward. And I've talked to Mike Flynn about this, who's the veterans liaison. It's the active consider adopting the senior citizen tax work off program. The issue with this always becomes the same thing. When we look at them working in our town departments, that's not very appealing because of the training and that such, so on and so forth. And then my issue is only the $1,500. It's just not enough money to like look at it. So I'd like to take a harder look at working with um, Bruce Tarr about other options that we have for our seniors. So just bringing that kind of talking about it. And it's not recommended by the Board of Assessors either. No, I know. And then lastly, um, Brendan, this is more for you, is that since 2016, we've talked about the um, Harbor River use fee, which yep. I annually say I think is a great idea. Do we know if the Harbor Master's looked into this or if he's reviewing what other communities are doing? Because I know one of the great ones is the Danvers one. I don't think so. The last person to really take a hard look at it was Peter Silva when he was Harbor Master. Okay. I could ask the Harbor Master. I'll, I'll find out more information. Okay. So that was it on that. So this uh, thing about the wedding reception, we we that, said we took a vote not to so that rent that, in that twenty three. The, the vote that yeah was all that stuff off. Okay. Now an update on the um, town custodian um, situation. We had we had three custodians. One of them is still working at the public safety building, nineteen hours a week. We had a custodian that was doing nineteen hours a week at this building he decided to move on and take other employment. So that's a vacancy. At the same time, Jerry Muse, who was doing the senior center, the water plant, and the Memorial Park restrooms, has retired. So we have two vacancies. Right now, fortunately, on a temporary basis, the um, custodian for the police and fire department can handle all of these things and just be paid more, more hours per week. 
I had someone come in today because we have advertised both positions and the person comes from running her own cleaning company for 20 years and wants to just take on part-time work. I haven't heard from anyone else yet and we really are really trying to actively find people who might want this type of work. My question is, knowing me knowing exactly what we need and knowing what some people have fallen short on, I'd like to just be able to hire these people, but it's up to the board to delegate that to me. I think that's fine. Do you want a motion? Yeah. I will entertain a motion to delegate the hiring of said custodial, custodial employee of both positions to Town Administrator Brendan Zubricki. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. And if there, if there is anyone out there that you know or uh, you want to get the word out, um, it's 19 hours a week and the hours are fairly flexible. So my time's opening up. Maybe I'll... <laughs> it might be a conflict. <laughs> Oh, you have to wait one year before you can actually apply. Um, okay, so next on the agenda is a change of manager. So I'm sad to see that Mr. Collins has not joined us tonight because as part of this, um, I did check in with Pam from the licensing board perspective to make sure it didn't require a public hearing and it does not. She checked with the ABCC. So we don't require a public hearing. However, given that we have had deficiencies with the manager of record following the addendum to the premises, I was hoping he would be here so I could reinforce that. So um, he's not. I will entertain a motion to approve the change of manager for Great Marsh Brewing Company from Danielle Woke to John Collins. And I would like to make sure that the minutes reflect that Mr. Collins must make himself familiar with the addendum to the description of premises. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 You say make familiar. We should, we should say perhaps acknowledge in writing. Sure, let's acknowledge in writing. That's the change of manager. I will entertain a motion to approve the commercial shellfish permit, the senior shellfish permit, the student's shellfish permit, and the non-resident shellfish permit as listed. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will just give the reminders that the Spring Cape Inn Caucus, it will be at the Essex Town Hall on Friday, March 10th, 2023 at 1 p.m., third floor auditorium. And the next regular Board of Selectmen's meeting will take place Monday, March 13th at 6 p.m. in the third floor auditorium of the Town Hall, 30 Martin Street. Brendan already did the Essex, um, or the Apple Street Road bed elevation on March 14th with the Conservation Commission. And then if everybody can just put a tickler in their phone about the potential Finance Committee Board of Selectmen meeting, Eight. March 8th. Uh, what, I guess what time we'll- would that be, seven? Probably seven. I would imagine seven. We'll, I guess we'll get confirmation of that after further discussion. Then on, on March 13th, we think we're going to see at least the chairman of the planning board coming in to, to do some pre-discussion about um, the zoning project. And there'll be, a, as I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we're looking at a joint meeting of the planning board and the selectmen about that project on March 22nd. And then there'll be an April date. I think it was April 12th. It's on that schedule I gave you for the public, the next public forum concerning the zoning. And we'll get these all updated for you as well for the next meeting. Okay, so given that we're at the end of the meeting, I wanna give everybody the opportunity for public comment. Is there anybody on the line with us this evening that has public comment? If you do, please unmute yourself, state your name and address, and then please use this opportunity. Okay, um, Thayer McKenzie, I see that you are on the line with us this evening. We actually discussed your, Thayer, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, oh. I'm here. Hi there, yes. how are you? So we actually had um, 
a resident of Kenomo Point in the room with us at the beginning of the meeting as well as his attorney. So we put that to the beginning of the agenda so that we could um, honestly let the attorney leave. And you weren't with us, but the board did unanimously vote to approve the revised version of the um, toddler fence at 162 Kenomo Point Road. Okay, um, who was the, yeah, I wasn't on in the beginning of the meeting. It was Harlan's attorney. Connor, somebody. Oh. Okay, thank, thanks for letting and, me know. And also Thayer, they approved it at three and a half foot height. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, have a good night. Is there anybody else on the line with public comment? Okay, anybody in the room? Hi, Teresa Whitman, 8 Lufkin Street, and uh, chairperson for the MERC School Committee. Um, thank you. I just wanted to um, ask, bring a couple things up, given that there was considerable discussion about school um, items, and so I kept my notes. Um, one, I just want to be very clear that that 3-8 date, that March 8 date, um, for a joint meeting. So Ben and I had this discussion by text on Friday. I got that information to Pam and Avi this morning when I met with them. And they were given a range of dates, 3.8, 3.9, and also a potentially a 3.16 was on the initial list. So I just want to be very careful that you guys aren't truly banking on that immediately because I know that things book up for them. However, they, they agree, they want to do this all as well, but so much of the conversation felt like that was a done thing, and I just want to be clear. Okay. That may not be exactly the date. Um, and then just on, to, on two points, one regarding the conversation um, about the data requests the request for data. Um, I just want to clarify the information that I have about the request for the classroom data had come up in conversation in collaboration meetings and also outside of collaboration meetings. And the my understanding of the answer that's been put forth um, has been that the process, to refer back to the process, which is that when any new reports are generated or, or what have you, the first step is that they review that information with the school committee. And then after reviewing it with the school committee, they will disseminate it to the towns. That is my understanding of the expectation for this, and in fact that, the, that this data in particular is going to be reviewed with the school committee in March, I believe on the 16th, at the meeting where we're discussing um, the potential for bringing in more kids by school choice because that's a directly relevant situation for that. That the, the conversation about um, finding efficiencies at the high school, the solution there is, is certainly to get the data out there, but the conversation has to take place about bringing in school choice kids and also that, the, again, the bigger solution was the, the aligning in the next year, studying out how to align the middle school and the high school schedules so that they can share some staff and move forward with some efficiencies that way. But I just want to be clear that, that there is an expectation of that information coming, and it sounded like there were concerns that that wasn't the case. The follow-up to that is that I have not been made aware of any requests. So if any of you are requesting things of district administration, please CC your school committee members, because as you know, our superintendent answers to the school committee. I'm not saying that she shouldn't respond to you, but I'm saying, if we don't know that you have requests out there that are not being answered, I can't act on it and encourage that. So if I'm just hearing about it here in this meeting informally, it's a little bit easier. If I'm CC'd on an email with a, re with a follow-up request for information, I can follow up on that as well and support your need to get that information. Or I can say, hey, by the way, she happens to be at the national conference this week and you'll probably hear back, you know, next week that sort of thing so please keep you're not speaking of the classroom data you do know about that request right i i know exactly about that request and you're yes. talking about other requests i'm saying i'm saying that or anything else yes because the the classroom data will be given after it's reviewed with the school committee right we brought that up meeting. in collaboration and in fact uh, selectman bradford sent it to you may have been copied um january 6th yes and i guess what i'm getting at is the answer that was given wasn't we're not going to do it or an ignoring of it. It is it was we've got the we've got the ability to access the information. We're putting it together, but before we just send it out to the towns, our procedure is to review it with the school committee, which will happen at our meeting in March when we go through the school choice information. So it's not that there's a neglect 
to provide it. It's, it hasn't happened yet, but this, this is planned. And so I guess my, my concern is if that's not being communicated effectively to everyone, because I've had this conversation with a couple different people, that that, that be resolved. I'd like, you know, I'd like to see that be much more clearly resolved for sure. So that information is forthcoming. They have to review it with us first. That's the, pol the practice. Um, but I believe that that meeting is going to be 316. So at that point, you should have all of the, the classroom and Do you know whether we need to clarify? I think the request is for all sections this school year. Okay, that I don't, so. So I should talk with Pam about that? I, I think we're gonna need to have another collaboration meeting anyway to go through that, but I think that the, the ask was pretty clear, how they're working on it and planning right. and presenting I just want, it. I don't have the details I don't wanna get that. to the end of it and we say, well, wait a minute, that's not what we wanted. Understandable. That, I'm just trying yeah. to head that off right now. Yep, I can yeah. understand that, yep, yep. And if, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I can understand that. I think the request was pretty clear. I think there it would be a good be. idea for you to have a chat with Ben and, and make him aware of that as well, that on the 8th, we wouldn't be getting, we wouldn't be talking about that. Just so And I don't want to speak no without him here, but he and I, yeah, we had that conversation. Okay, if you so, had yeah, that. Yeah, he if, does if know that that's, yeah. the, that's where we are with that too. That's perfectly fair, yeah. Now, yes, that's, that makes sense. And so that may impact the timing of when you guys choose to have that meeting, depending. Yeah, I mean, it actually, it, it sort of does. Well, the problem is that we're having our final budget discussions on the 13th, so the information on the 16th doesn't actually help that discussion, yeah. So, which is why we requested it June 6th. I'm sorry, January 6th. So can I, can I ask, and you can stop me, by the way, because I know that your public comment things are different than, than how we do, so you can stop me if, if you need to at any time. Um, what is What is the outcome of this what are you planning to do with that so that so that i can understand i can understand better what is it to you plot the data on a on a on a chart to right. do a scatter plot right for what to what end is what i'm i want to understand how this is furthering to the see, budget conversation to here. see how the data show the range of class sizes mm -hmm. um, across the continuum of you know a class that only has a few students right up to classes that are much closer to the target of 22 or whatever the number is. And, and help me understand why that's critical to do before the budget. Because anecdotally, we keep hearing, the finance committee members and the selectmen keep hearing from people who suggest that there are many small classes within the district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so I, I, I think the point, and I get, I, I, I get Teresa's point, it's, th there's nothing about the budget being approved that is that is dependent on this the budget the budget going into the warrant I, I, I should say right the warrant isn't going to carry figures you're right the motion will right so the I guess her point uh, Teresa's point is though on the on the, the, the the, the, our, our treatment or our consideration of, the, of this information is really more about how are we going to structure the, the, the process of getting the budget approved. Perhaps, unless it had some bearing on how you wanted to structure the warrant itself. And I don't, I don't know because I don't know what the data is going to show. Which could be changed subsequent to the 16th, right? Is it when, when, did the, when does the warrant become? The tw you're signing it on the 27th, but Sorry, I think 27th. the chairman's saying that you're, you're kind of last bite at it before it gets completely tuned up by town council is, is the, the 13th. 13th. Right. Right. Well, thank you. I just, again, I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that the answer, it may not be an ideal time frame. I do understand that, but that my understanding had been that the answer was given, that this is when they will be presenting it to school committee and therefore that will, that's when that information will be distributed. If that ha wasn't communicated clearly, then that's something that, um, that we can work on making sure happens uh, more clearly for sure. I, and then my second um, question is just about the field um, situation. The discussion tonight moving forward with, um, with an expectation of putting that vote on the, um, in the fall town meeting rather than the spring. This is new um, to the conversation. Um, I know Brendan brought it up very briefly in our meeting with Hilltop Advisors. Um, and 
I want to know a little bit more from your perspective because I can say that knowing the time frame of what what we've been moving forward with um, in that meeting, Avi did say, or the business manager for the district did say he would not recommend, uh, he would not recommend to the school committee that they move forward on a project without the votes having already taken place or without the votes taking place this spring, um, partly because our contract language with um, the, for the contracts that went out to bid and as we're now getting ready to award a contract includes a contingency that this needs to pass. Um, the plan had been originally, of course, to use the district reserves. This, this new opportunity came about and it seemed like a win-win for both towns because then it keeps a capital expense out of the operating budget and preserves um, the district reserve so that as we go to prepare for borrowing for a future EES, we're not trying to replenish that through the operating budget each year. Um, if if you are truly looking at trying to make this a fall thing, I think it would be wise to have a conversation uh, maybe with the collaborative group sooner rather than later because I know Manchester is planning to move forward with their, um, they're going to print on the 8th and we were moving forward with the school committee vote to approve the project in total um, on the 7th and I think this is something we'll need to discuss because I don't know I can't speak for the committee and what they would support or not support in this, but I think it'll make a difference in this conversation and I'm not sure how it would work if we had one town voting in the spring and one town voting in the fall. Um, the, the only thing I would add to that is just uh, to clarify that um, I, think you, I think you, a couple of you at least are on this, this email from Avi that the current plan is not to issue debt until late summer or early fall once the project costs are finalized. So we're not looking to take on the debt until those costs are finalized and that the current plan was for the district to move forward with those contracts uh, with reserves and then replenish that with the borrowing once that was finalized um, and that moving forward with Highland it would make a difference as to whether we move forward with Brook Street or not. So just, just as a, a reminder, the total cost of the, the project, um, the high watermark, again, contingencies aside, but what we will be approving or what is being put forward for a vote is a $1.6 million project and that borrowing would be for um, the cost of the, no, not to exceed the cost of, of that minus Manchester's roughly 400,000 contribution for half of Brook Street and also I don't think we should lose sight of the earmarked $25,000 that Representative Belzito um, secured for us from the state as well and anything else that comes yeah. our way. Do, do you know, oh, just a question, do you know why Avi ran the numbers that were looked at tonight at 1.2 if your intent is to be at 1.6? 1. 1.6 is the total. from Manchester in cash. Yeah, so 400. Okay. Okay. It's minus, yeah, that's minus. Yeah, so it's still a 1.6 total product. All right, so I get that. As far as talking further about the fall town meeting decision. Yeah. I don't know that there's gonna be anything to offer you in collaboration because my understanding is that's the decision they just made and unless they're gonna change that decision right here, right now, that's the decision. So, no. Teresa, I yeah. also wanna point out when you say, you know, we thought it was a win-win. Back when we go to the school committee meeting, the hearing where this was discussed, actually town accountant Jeff Sula brought it up. If you recall, it wasn't about borrowing. At that time, we said, we have an idea. We have $400,000 in, in free cash. Why don't we just commit so that it doesn't go on to our tax base? Yep. So at no point did we talk about borrowing. We were always talking about doing this in cash. Right. So then being on the call with Hilltop Advisors and Bond Council was, I mean, especially when it was uh, factored in at 5%, I was a little bit caught off guard when the number was $100,000 in interest. Yep. Hearing forty to sixty is a little bit more palatable tonight, but why would you want to spend forty to sixty thousand dollars if you right. don't have to? Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I think that it, it just doesn't make sense from a financial point of view when we're going to our residents and saying, by the way, we're going to be asking you to add seven hundred and sixty-five dollars annually on top of the average household. Um, it's just more debt. So fully agree. And to my understanding, and we had a, a subcommittee meeting about this today, and to, to that we clarified was that. Um, either way, Essex would be allowed with a, a joint agreement between the two municipalities to pay their portion in cash, whether it was with a spring vote or a fall vote or whenever it is, that Essex 
could do that because it doesn't make sense to borrow if you don't have to, if, right. if you've got the cash up front. That's, that's something that we fully support. I guess I just, I think that, um, that the idea of having, of asking the committee to vote a project to move forward that is gonna have one of the member, member towns uncommitted until fall is going to be a concerning um, especially if, if uh, our business managers are not recommending it. So what would you do then, go back to your original proposal to just pay it out of the district's reserves? That's what I don't know, hmm. because this isn't this. So, so at that point, we would then need to reevaluate re the whole situation, which we hope wouldn't, sure. wouldn't hold but things up. But I just wanted yeah. to be clear to you, it doesn't sound like this board is changing its, um, its vote to put it on the annual town meeting. It sounds like the board wants to put it on the fall town meeting, and I won't be able to offer you anything in collaboration that varies from that vote. Okay, so is this something that could be reconsidered at the next meeting though, because this isn't something that anyone was able to offer any input or discussion or understanding of? Um, if we knew that this was something that the board was considering, um, we might have been able to have discussion in advance to help not just or me understand for the committee, but help the district administrators understand and help our other partner town understand. Maybe it's better for everyone to do it in the fall, but for us to be on the same page about this. So you, uh, I guess what we probably need to do is hear back on the dates that Avi and Pam give you for the joint meeting. Because if we're meeting on March 8th, then the school committee will be together and you can discuss it then. I can't guarantee that the whole school committee will be together on March 8th. This is, I don't even know that Pam and Avi are available on March 8th. Or, or whatever, whatever okay. the date is. I guess get back to us with the date. So, uh, and again, I, I think we're going to have to have some, maybe we'll take this offline, um, but our, our other town partner needs us to vote on this so that they can get it on their warrant. They go to print on March 8th. They're already a little stressed about us having the vote on March 7th being so tight in time. We have to approve the project itself. This is going to be another confounding variable very late in the game. And um, so there may be some, some concern about that such that this, this changes things considerably. All I'm saying is we, I didn't know that this was something. And so um, my request is just that we um, maybe in the next couple days um, make ourselves available to, to try to work this out and, and understand a little bit better. As I said in the meeting, with the town, when the town gets a grant, we, co we commonly have to go a year, year and a half funding the money, and then we have to get it back from the state. I mean, it, I it's a common that. occurrence. I, it is common. It is. The, I think part of my personal concern is that we have a committee that is still learning, and we, we have had in the last couple of years, um, this year we've had a lot of healing and bridging between uh, the school committee and the town, the town board certainly, but it's been contentious through the COVID things, um, through, through the COVID years a little bit, and I'm not sure that, I'm not sure how our committee will respond to the idea of moving forward with a project with only one town partner committed at the moment. How secure do you think that it is that this would pass at a fall town meeting? I have no idea. All they can do is promise to put it on, on there. So it would be difficult for us to ask the other town partner to move forward with this if we kind of need both, both players to be at the table. So I guess you know, I don't need to take up more of your time with this. This was new news to me as of tonight, and so um, that was a little bit concerning to me, but we will work through it just like we work through everything. Well, I think well, it's the board's first opportunity to discuss it. Well, I was going to say, it's the board's first opportunity because the whole board was not on the call, which was just last week. So it was our first, well, it was Brennan and I's first time hearing about, you know, what the debt would look like and how that would be structured and what the interest would be. So this is all new to us as well. That's fair. So that's, so tonight right, is I, the I first conversation. I actually said at that meeting that I had to bring the figures back to the board Correct. so the board could yep, consider in, it. Yeah. So I guess my question is, in if this is the first that you're hearing of and the first you're learning of it, is there not room for consideration as we now have new information that this might affect the project in total and the timing of it and our other town partner to move forward to reconsider spring versus fall? I guess, my, I guess what I would say is that while our finance committee was in session, they pretty unanimously supported the idea of bringing um, an intermunicipal agreement to fall town meeting. 
and not, or, or the idea of an intermunicipal agreement to put an article on file town meeting warrant mm -hmm. to fund this. And they, as the finance committees, are advisory board from any sort of fiduciary responsibility. So I think we pretty much all defer to their financial expertise to yeah. guide us. Sure. And that was pretty unanimous that that's what they suggested we do. Okay. I took something different from it, but that's okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank you. your time. All right. It is 1010. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.